Three, and we have a couple items on our agenda. We have the elected officials transportation committee meeting preparation, followed by a Park Avenue improvements project and a discussion of West End mobility safety assessment, and then some time for some council led discussion around West End traffic, uh, as well as any opportunities for council board reports and council updates. Um, and with that, we're going to get right into our first topic, which is EOTC meeting prep. Hey, Bon. I didn't see it. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Linda Dupriest, EOTC director, and uh, here to take maybe 10 minutes tops to prep you for the EOTC meeting that's coming up on June 29th. Um, it's going to be at the town of Snowmass Village in their chambers starting at 4 o'clock. Um, today we're also going to talk about just decisions reached from our last meeting and a couple of agenda items. Linda, could you, yes. I just want to check in particularly with two new council members, if it would be helpful to have a little bit of background of what the EOTC does. Um, this would be their first EOTC meeting that they'll, they'll be joining in at. Okay. Um, the EOTC Elected Officials Transportation Committee was formed in the 90s um, as a coalition government entity, uh, Snowmass, Town of Snowmass Village, City of Aspen and Pickin County to work on transportation issues in the Upper Valley. It was, um, there was things going on back then. There was an air quality issue. There was a new <coughs> uh, federal transportation bill that required some planning. And so the folks in the Upper Valley very uh, innovative and boldly decided to form this entity and start working on some regional transportation issues. So. Um, we have, um, I've been in the position just since last October. We have four meetings a year. And um, because all of y'all, 15 officials, only get together at those times, we started doing these quick prep meetings um, between the time when the packet went out and the meeting happens, just to give some time to talk about some questions or just, you know, just kind of let you know what's coming up. And also, could you please specify it's mass public transit? Yes, so the EOTC is formed, is funded by the transit sales tax that passes through to RAFTA, and then the EOTC has some funding from that. And um, <coughs> our mandate really is to work on um, planning, implementation um, of just public transportation facilities. So. 
you know, transit issues, um, bicycling, walking. Um, we are working on the parking lots, the intercept lot and the buttermilk lot. So anything we don't really um, are not supposed to work on just things that involve single <coughs> occupant vehicle travel. That, didn't that hit it, Sarah? Okay, sure. And uh, for you new folks, um, I could send you any kind of background materials or anything on the OTC or answer questions anytime you'd like, contact me. Okay, so Snowmass is hosting the meeting on the um, 29th, starts at four. Um, it's in person and virtual. The, um, the meeting link is in the packet. It's also in the agenda that's published on the town of Snowmass's um, website. And before you go further than that, um, do council members uh, or do we be thinking of whether you're going to be in person or virtual? Oh, yeah. 3D. You're going? I think so. I'll be in person. Right on. I'm going to try. Great. Sounds like a full house. Okay, great. Um, so the first thing we'll go over is the decisions reached. Really in the last, in the April 6th meeting, um, we didn't have an, uh, a public hearing on an item, but there was a pretty robust discussion about the HOV lane enforcement. Um, and we were given some directives to come back um, later on with some more information. Um, with everything that's going on with everybody right now in transportation, we. Um, are asking if we can do that in August. And what we would like to do is get someone from CDOT to call into the meeting to explain some of the more technical aspects of the HOV lane, um, what the EOTC can and cannot work on, spend money on, how it relates to the record of decision. Um, uh, Mayor Torre had asked about HOV lane configurations, um, among other things. So that's going to come up in August. Question for you? Just a correction for the minutes that Skippy Mesro was also not in attendance. Pardon me? The minutes reflect that, uh, should reflect that Skippy Mesro was not in attendance. Oh, is that incorrect? Okay, <clears throat> I'll fix that. That's right, he was at the prep meeting but not at the EOTC meeting, so I got that one. Um, <clears throat> the main thing we're going to discuss is the project we've been working on at the Buttermilk Crossing, the Buttermilk Intersection and the Transit Signal Bypass Project, which was on our work plan for this year. It was part <laughs> of um, a set of near-term transit improvement projects that we were, have been working on in the whole Upper Valley. Um, <clears throat> we're going to have a presentation by STM, the consulting firm we hired, and DHM, who did the public outreach, to, um, <coughs> Bless. Thank you. <laughs> um, the idea with this project was try to create, um, some better movement of the transit vehicles through that intersection and also deal with the perceived safety issue of, um, all of the skiers crossing the highway there at Buttermilk. It's a project that's been discussed for a few years now. So we, this project um, looked at the engineering feasibility of doing an overpass versus an underpass. If we, um, if it's really needed from a safety standpoint and then cost estimates on the crossing piece. The other piece was the transit signal bypass part of it, which we told you back in April, um, the staff, the staff and the technical advisory committee and the consultant decided was not a feasible improvement there. There's safety problems um, with ch trying to channel the traffic through there. And also we determined it wouldn't um, generate that much time savings for the buses. So we're going to go over all that, all the technical pieces of those. Um, we do have a staff recommendation on the um, grade separation, whether or not to do a pedestrian overpass or underpass. We, um, we feel on the staff side that 
looking at the cost-benefit analysis there, that um, we don't feel that it makes sense to, to spend that money at this time there. These are the reasons, and we'll, of course, go into those in more detail. Um, there's no crash history there, really. Um, the pedestrian volumes are only really during the ski season. Um, it's excessively expensive to build even a, an overpass or an underpass there. And um, there's also a menu of lower cost options that we can do at that intersection to make it more comfortable and accessible for pedestrians there that we would like to explore. That would be um, nowhere near in the millions. So we can discuss that. And then of course we always have um, really high, high priorities for transportation funding as you all have been discussing in your mobility conversations here. Um, and then finally, even in trying to find outside funding for um, a separate grade separated crossing there uh, is probably not likely to happen um, because there's no crash history and some of the other aspects of it. So we'll all be ready to talk about those. Um, and then we just have some work plan updates that we're going to give. Um, the Snowmass Regional Transit Analysis, we're going to be talking a little bit about that. Um, you all might have, are probably aware that the um, Transit Center project in Snowmass that they've been working on up there for several years, that the um, development, uh, re, the development application was um, um, turned down by the city. So Sam Guarino, who's the Transportation Director in Snowmass Village, is going to present an update on what their next steps are going to be. Um, the EOTC has set aside around $6 million for that project. Oh, it's kind of been set aside for several years now, so eventually we will be, we'll be discussing what that funding is gonna go towards. Um, we'll have an update on the Brush Creek Park and Ride construction project. Um, <coughs> the temporary parking situation's been working really well. The project's on schedule. And um, Pickin County, we just put in a uh, application for a federal grant to get um, all the EV chargers out there, the infrastructure put in, both the long-term ones and then the fast chargers. So we're working with Holy Cross Energy on that grant application and just put that in. Um, Pete Rice is going to give an update to all the EOTC members on the Newcastle Creek Bridge project. Um, and then we, we probably are, we're not going to have CDOT present this month. We're going to come back in August with that, so that's a mistake up there. And then um, we'll talk briefly about the permanent automatic vehicle counter project that we have. Um, we have been looking at the different technologies out there. And one of the providers um, called Precor is actually um, going to be doing a free month-long uh, trial of their technology here. Um, we're going to be setting it up roughly in the lumberyard area. And that technology is um, it's a video and AI that can tell us uh, traffic volumes, type of vehicles and the speeds they're going. So it's really advanced technology and we're really excited to just try it out. Um, and then here are all the locations for, pardon me, the permanent vehicle counters. Brush Creek Road, Owl Creek Road, Highway 82, somewhere in the vicinity of the ABC, McLean Flats Road, the Castle Creek Bridge, Power Plant Road, and Lower Maroon Creek. And then that's it. Any questions? Any questions at this time? Um, on that last item, the permanent automatic vehicle counters, um, do we have access or do we use geo tracking? Um, is that available to us? And I'm just recalling um, cell phone tracking. Um, Right, AirSage was the vendor when that work was performed back in 2017-ish, 18, I can't recall which. Um, real quick, do, does, do these counters uh, include the ability to determine the county the license plate is registered in, or municipality? Probably, but I'm not gonna commit to that right now. Um, would, 
if that's something we want to do. It just might be the way to get the data you're looking for is how far are people traveling, not just that they're stuck in traffic. So um, we, we have a couple of different tools that we might be able to deploy either in conjunction with the EOTC or independent from that. Um, for that, I, I know that's been a request of council for us to look at this for some time um, and try to do it in an ongoing basis rather than a snapshot study <coughs> approach. Um, so why don't we follow up maybe offline staff yep. a little bit more? Great. And then I recall the other piece of that you wanted to Count the, at least the previous council wanted an idea of count um, uh, in the east east side uh, heading uh, in and out of uh, Highway 82 on the pass. Uh, uh, and this is actually some interesting technology to deal with uh, understanding how frequent the, the vehicle length law is getting broken. Mm -hmm. It'd really help target some enforcement. Yeah, I, I, I think this uh, data collection is invaluable. We're all trying to make uh, some headway on transit and mobility um, and uh, you know identifying who we're targeting and who the users are I think is very important so I'm very excited about traffic counts but also as much information that can come along with that as well okay yeah I'm curious if the AI might be used to identify vehicles that have made the trip repeatedly coming in and out in and out in and out? I would think so. It's pretty sophisticated yeah. stuff. We can get into the uh, It is pretty powerful, and a lot of things that you're asking for can tie into our system with license plates, and that's where, you know, it depends on how far we want to take this, like Sarah was saying. Um, but you would definitely be able to get who's coming and how many times, like especially to the airport and things like that. That's really important. Which, yeah, which would be great to know the, the repeat user and, and separating that from both long distance mileage deliveries type stuff. And yeah, I think we're going to get a lot out of this. That'd be great. Bill. Thanks. Thanks, Linda. Nice to meet you. Um, I know this is a little bit outside of the EOTC purview based on what you said in your introduction, um, but relating to the buttermilk crossing, which, which I do think in general is a good idea. I think we have a traffic flow issue on Highway 82. It's not so much a traffic volume issue, it's a flow issue. And so one of the things that I would like to explore in my time on council is, is vehicular underpasses, similar to what we have <coughs> at um, Stage Road. So has there been any study of a combination of a vehicular underpass and a pedestrian underpass when you undertook the pedestrian study effort? Has that been studied elsewhere that I'm not aware of? Do you want me to, uh, yeah, there is past studies that dive into some of that, like as far as the underpasses specifically within the ABC and all that, they were briefly described at the time, but kind of cut out because of the cost implications and the land acquisition and pieces like that. However, it, that was, I think the 82 access control was done in 2012 maybe, um, and there's a couple more that are earlier than that. It's probably something that we could look at, but I would say. Well, yeah, maybe we can get into it with our efforts relating to mobility and stuff. But you know, maybe maybe the pedestrian underpass comes back to life if if indeed it doesn't get um, approved now in conjunction with the vehicular underpass, and it's all one cohesive project. We can look at it for our 2024 work plan for sure. Yeah. Um, thanks. And then, could you flip back one or two slides? There was something else that I think I had a question on, but um, oh, Newcastle Creek Bridge. I may have gotten distracted there, but I don't think we talked much about it. I think you're, you're obviously it's aware that we weren't super supportive of, of the latest plan, so. Yeah, and this is, so because the OTC is 15 elected officials um, <coughs> and, you know, Snowmass and the other entities are probably reading in the paper about all the issues that are happening with everybody, but to make sure that, that we get it deliberated in a, in a public forum, we do these updates from from all the different members of their current projects. So that's what this is. It's this looks at reviewing May 15th's work session, letting the other members know the direction, you know, where the focus primarily was, looking at the pieces that you are directing our, your staff um, to do at this point, and then having a discussion, like she said, as a group. Perfect. Thanks. That's all it is. That's great. Kind of an update. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. Thank you. See you in Snowmass. Yes. <laughs> See you there.
It's not a bad slogan for them, huh? Ski and snow mass? Right? Yeah. It's a winner. Ski and snow mass. Excuse me. Watch your leg. <laughs> it's closer than I thought. <laughs> um, all righty. I'm gonna share my screen. <clears throat> it's gonna be Carly's. It's Linda's. Here, okay. I think I've got it now. <coughs> yes. How is that? Awesome. Oh, I'll project. <laughs> awesome. Um, hi, I'm Carly McGowan. I'm um, here with Trish Aragon and with Pete Rice. I'm the project manager and designer on the Park Avenue Improvement Project. The purpose of this presentation is twofold. It's to update new council members on the Park Avenue project history, and it's also to revisit the project with council to make sure that the path is clear moving forward. I'll go over the background of the project the history with council and with the neighborhood. We'll take a look at the proposed design and then I'll look to council for further direction. Before jumping into the presentation, I do want to give a preview of the request of council. At the end of this meeting, I'll be requesting council direction on whether or not to move forward with the current design um, for finalization and bid process for construction of 2024. So we'll start with the why. This project has two major components. It has a pedestrian component and a stormwater component. We'll start with the pedestrian piece. We've heard from people in the community that this corridor feels unsafe while using this road, whether you're walking, biking, or in some cases even driving. We've all walked along this corridor. Um, it feels like vehicles have very high speeds. In reality, um, the uncomfortable feeling the root of that is really the shared space between pedestrians, bikers, and vehicles, the lack of separation, and therefore protection. The northern block of Park Avenue is a key connection between town via the East Hopkins Bridge and one of the most, if not the most popular hiking trail we have in town, Smuggler Road. People cross the East Hopkins Bridge coming from town in this very dedicated, um, lovely, safe, pedestrian space, they turn left up Park Avenue to head up to the trailhead, and just like that, you're back in vehicle traffic, back in a vehicle space. Um, there may be a bus coming at you down the hill, there may be a vehicle behind you. It's a busy corridor and it can feel intimidating, almost to the point where you wanna step off the road and hide in someone's yard. It's really important to see this project through a community lens. The problem affects everyone who walks, rolls, pushes a stroller, rides a bike, drives a car uh, through this corridor. Uh, the pool of people who use this space is, is a large portion of the community, both tourists um, and residents. The other piece of this project is the stormwater component. So the Park and Midland neighborhood currently has no underground conveyance system for stormwater, and the neighborhood has some major historic drainage issues. Houses are down below the roadway, Homeowners, in some cases, are using sandbags to keep water out of their homes. There are icing and ponding issues on the streets, so much so that um, at certain times of year, our streets in this area look like lakes. These issues have been a concern of the city for years. Um, the concern has led the engineering department in 2015 to study this drainage basin and this um, larger neighborhood in depth to create the Smuggler Hunter Surface Drainage Master Plan. The master plan was, uh, you know, did two main things. It recognized the existing drainage patterns and deficiencies, and it also presented so solutions for the entire drainage basin. Um, this project is outlined as the first step in reaching that solution. Stormwater conveyance can be really complicated. Um, this is the start of placing infrastructure to solve a larger drainage issue in the Park and Midland region. You really have to start at the bottom of the system. This project also incorporates water, water quality <coughs> treatment. Right now, these flows coming from the entire neighborhood, coming from part of Smuggler Mountain, are all flowing into the river, contributing to, to pollution, um, and flowing down through the Roaring Fork untreated. So now we'll talk about neighborhood and council history. 
In 2008, off the page on this timeline, <laughs> it would have been a really small text if we decided to include 08. Um, this project was discussed among the community, council, um, and staff. Three design alternatives plus a do nothing option were all presented. Um, the community outreach included a vote on the subject. Council ultimately voted in favor of the do nothing option. That leads us to more presently, more recently, um, the project resurfaced. In 2019, staff and council began, began hearing from the community about safety concerns. Um, and council directed staff to investigate options for safety and for connectivity in this neighborhood. Staff sent nearly 400 invitations to residents and homeowners in this neighborhood and met for one-on-one -on -one meetings with 25 uh, residents or homeowners in personal settings, including in some cases in their home, walking through the neighborhood, you know, boots on the ground, looking at the issues that people see day to day. It's important to note while we discuss outreach, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the outreach throughout this process has been with the Park and Midland neighborhood. Um, it hasn't been representative of the entire community of Aspen and that pool of people that use this corridor, um, but it's important to note that this project really is a community asset. So in July of 2020, um, staff presented the results of those one-on-one -on -one meetings that were held in 2019, um, broken down into two general categories, um, feedback, was varied, um, but there was a couple um, major concerns in the neighborhood. In general, Park Avenue neighbors, one of their main concerns was the aesthetics in the area. On Midland, one of the main concerns among others was the drainage issues. In August of 2020, staff outlined the next steps for um, uh, short-term solutions, data collection, and plans for continued outreach moving forward. One of those plans for continued outreach included a community survey that was sent out by staff um, targeting the Park and Midland neighborhood. 56 people <laughs> responded to this. 90% uh, of them identified as residents in the Park and Midland neighborhood. Here were the results of two of the questions that were asked during this survey. Um, as you can see here, based on this survey, 68% of the respondents supported a sidewalk completion on the east side of Park Avenue. 24% supported a one-way configuration couplet between Park Avenue and Midland Avenue. In January of 2021, staff presented three items. Uh, we presented the community outreach, um, including the two questions that I just shared with you as well as traffic study results um, from a traffic study that was completed over um, the course of the fall of 2020, as well as four options to proceed forward. So the traffic study takeaways. Um, in general, the traffic study found that speeding is not present along the area of interest. You can see there's an average speed and an 85th percentile, which is really what we use to determine and look at speed limits, um, called out in blue northbound and southbound on the Park Avenue, the northern block of Park Avenue. Um, the traffic study also found that a uh, one-way configuration is likely to increase speeds. When you have more space for vehicles, they tend to go faster. Um, it recommended enhancing the pedestrian crossing at Park Avenue and Hopkins, and it also recommended completing a sidewalk connection on the east side of Park Ave. So those four options that were presented to council um, are shown here in a very conceptual, schematic way. Um, on the top left, you have the one-way, top right, uh, two-way, completing the sidewalk on Park Avenue. <coughs> Bottom left was um, solely looking at the intersection at Park and Hopkins, and then um, in the bottom right is the do-nothing option that was um, on the table as well in 08. So council directed staff to proceed with the two-way um, sidewalk, maintaining a two-way traffic pattern and completing the sidewalk connection along the northern block of Park Avenue. In September of 2021, staff came back to council and presented this conceptual plan for the sidewalk along Park Ave, as well as shared some brief plans about the um, stormwater component of this based on the master plan. Prior to moving forward to detailed design, uh, council requested that staff meet with 
all of these neighbors directly affected on the northern block of Park Avenue one-on-one. -on -one. So staff reached out to the individual homeowners adjacent to the project site on that northern block of Park Ave for an additional round of outreach um, <coughs> to both inform neighbors of anticipated impacts and also coordinate, uh, sorry, um, to gather feedback on this conceptual plan. It was later on that we um, did some informing. Um, homeowners provided feedback on this conceptual design. The comments fit into three main categories. I mean, actually, before I jump there, I want to talk about this map. These were the homes that were reached out to in green and red. Um, in red were the homeowners that we were unable to reach at this time. Um, later in this process, we were able to reach all of the neighbors on Park Ave. The concerns from the community came in three general categories. And um, there were aesthetic concerns about the aesthetic impacts on Park Avenue. Concerns about the construction impacts, um, understandable, having a construction site near your house, and then also concerns about the property, property impacts. Each neighbor was asked to complete an acknowledgement form that gave them the chance not only to share their concerns and thoughts verbally, but also in writing. And these were included um, in the packet, the council packet for tonight. In February of 2020, staff came back to council. Um, we gave a summary of those one-on-one -on -one meetings, provided the design acknowledgement forms, um, and then. Um, carried forward into detailed design. Over the course of the last year or so, staff has been working on developing these detailed designs. Um, during that process, we met directly with the adjacent neighbors for another round of outreach. Um, this round of outreach had two main purposes. We informed neighbors about uh, where the plan is at, where it's going, and then coordinated mitigation of impacts. We'll get further into that later. Staff met, um, set up meetings with 15 neighbors shown on the map here. In some cases, this was the third or even fourth time meeting directly with Pete or with myself. Um, and these direct neighbors were all, um, as well as the Aspen Community Voice um, Project subscribers, were all invited to submit comment um, tonight uh, to be included in the council packet. We received one comment, and that was included in the council packet tonight. That brings us today, to today, June of 2023. So we've gone over the background, we've gone over the history. I want to talk about the proposed design. We're currently at 90% construction drawings um, to be finalized pending council direction. The design has two compon components, like we talked about earlier. There's the sidewalk component and there's the storm component. The proposed sidewalk um, is proposed on the east side of the roadway where there's existing sidewalk segments on either end of the block. The new sidewalk will span the property frontage of five properties and will be entirely in the right of way. Roadway shift um, will occur, the roadway will shift to the west just over five feet. Um, and that's the case in, along the frontage of one property. It's important to note um, the property line and the new proposed edge of roadway are still over 25 feet away. Um, the two other properties will see a roadway shift of less than six inches with the roadway moving closer to their property. Staff worked with the property owner at 325 Park Avenue to agree upon an easement for five square feet for asphalt placement um, to allow that road shift to happen. Throughout this design and outreach process, staff has been working with adjacent homeowners, like I mentioned earlier, to mitigate the impacts of these designs. Um, for example, one of those impacts is off-street parking. We know that parking is a commodity in this town, um, especially in this neighborhood where there's no on-street parking. Even though much of the off-street parking along Park Avenue is in the right-of-way, it's perceived to be part of private property. And so um, in the two locations where uh, off-street parking is being modified, staff sat down, we sat down with homeowners and looked at diagrams to see how vehicles can still be accommodated um, as they were as they currently are. I'm not gonna get into every detail, every specific detail of design here for the sake of time, but I'm more than happy to answer any specific questions about the design. Um, and then let's jump into the stormwater component of design. Same thing goes, um, I'll give the overview and I'm happy to go into more detail on anything in particular. In the Park and Midland neighborhood, there is a shocking lack of infrastructure knowing the amount of water that comes through this neighborhood. 
The proposed infrastructure is shown in purple. It'll start at the intersection of Park and Midland, and it'll end down at um, the East Hopkins Bridge where it outfalls just north of the trail and the bridge. Um, like I mentioned earlier, this piece of the project is really a first step to a larger solution. Um, the dashed purple lines show the uh, future improvements based on the master plan. Flows will mimic existing patterns, but less, less water will um, be running on the surface and more water will really be captured via inlets um, and treated via a water quality treatment mechanism um, down near the outfall. This is really a first opportunity in this neighborhood to capture the pollution on the streets um, and coming off of Smuggler Mountain before it reaches the river. We all know that the landscaping and aesthetics in this neighborhood are incredibly important. Um, it's really what makes Park Avenue and this neighborhood and Aspen in general such a lovely place to walk or bike, um, push a stroller. <clears throat> Staff has been working with the neighbors, um, in one case with their gardening team, as well as with the city forester and a landscape architecture firm, Norris Design, to develop landscape plans for the two landscape areas that are being disturbed. Both are shown here on the screen. Um, the design has taken into account these aesthetic elements to maintain a neighborhood feel. So we've gone over the background, we've talked about history um, and the proposed design. Um, now I'd like to look to council um, to answer any questions and ask council whether or not they support moving forward with finalized design and bid process for construction in 2024. Thank you. Questions? Oh, start. Thanks, Carly. Maybe we can go back to the slide about um, property owners on Park Avenue and the three categories of concern. Sure. Thanks. I think, I think this is, for me, the challenge here. Um, clearly, you have stormwater issues. Clearly, you have pedestrian safety issues. But you have, at least amongst people that I know, a lot of people who live on Park Avenue full time and who have lived there a long time that are not excited about this project, to say the least. Um, and I, they all seem to be quite informed about it. It's not like they're speaking from an uninformed position. So, you know, I get, I get the sort of resistance to change aspect of it. I get the impact on right away that feels like it belongs to you but doesn't actually belong to you. Um, Maybe you guys can elaborate a little bit on this. Is, are, there, are there other ways to accomplish the primary goals, which to me are stormwater and pedestrian safety? Those are really the only two things that I think, at least in my perspective, have merit here. I don't know if there's other issue, you know, primary goals or not, um, but the, you know, those seem to be the two big things. So are, are, there, are there lighter touch solutions I guess is my ultimate question, that could help meaningfully, maybe not fully address those two issues, but meaningfully address those two issues that might allay some of the concerns of the property owners. There are other, we've gone through several of them. Uh, we, sh we went through kind of the four, and I'll give you like a 30 second summary of some of the challenges. One of the big ones that we go with is the one way. And really, you still have the construction impacts with a one way. You temporarily changing traffic can get complicated in this area. And the hard part about a one way is right now we're not impacting all the Midland residents with this project. You add in the one way, all of a sudden it changes the entire neighborhood dynamic as far as traffic. Um, you can do smaller things, but really because the roadway is so tight, trying to put in bollards or something like that temporarily becomes a little bit problematic um, because right now we're creating space for pedestrians in a way that maintains roadway function. Um, and really, this is pretty light touch. To put in the storm, there's stormwater, we need the stormwater there. 
we need the water quality there. There really isn't a way around that because this basin all focalizes mostly through these houses. I know you've talked to the residents up on there, and so you really need the storm sewer regardless of the pedestrian safety. The pedestrian safety is a component of this that is in the <coughs> um, You really need that storm water in there for this. And you know, we can look at intersection improvements and people are always gonna go from Hopkins, it's a, you can watch it all summer and they're always gonna go on that right side of the road because half of it is already built with a sidewalk. So they're gonna follow that sidewalk and then it just dead ends. And so we're really, like Carly said, you know, putting in a proposed sidewalk there that's always been part of that plan. Got it. Is there, you just touched on something, Pete, about temporary bollards being difficult, but did you discuss a um, seasonal trial of one way or something like that? Has that been? It makes me nervous. So we've tried a couple we seasonal have, trials that have gone on in other, I would say similar streets like um, Gibson, and we put these bollards in and it does not go well. Um, vehicles, the difference between a curb, a vehicle next to a curb and next to a bollard, a bollard, they really kind of separate themselves out a little bit and so it can impede traffic quite a bit is what we found. And in this case, there just isn't a lot of road to do that. So if you're putting in a four foot area for bollards, they're already gonna swing out and then you have kind of that curve. And so Trish and I have always been very uncomfortable about placing bollards in a temporary situation because we actually might be making it worse. Okay, I think that's it for my questions right now. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, the survey that you pointed to about support for the sidewalks, that was for Park and Midland Ad Avenue residents. Um, from my understanding, I've been told that Park and Midland, although the same neighborhood, have very different opinions about this sidewalk. And I would be curious if it was just Park Ave, whether they agreed on this, because the comments that we've received have been very negative towards the sidewalk on Park Ave. Um, some other things that I think of are, a lot of this talk is about sending people to Smuggler, and I know there's the No Problem Joe Trail, which could take people to Oklahoma Flats and up to Smuggler that way from the East Aspen neighborhood. So I wonder if people could be directed that way if they wanted an all sidewalk way to go to Smuggler. Or um, Mascot 99, which I know from Mascot Lane also connects to Smuggler um, without having to go down Park Ave. Um, but would have to go down Midland, and I, I wonder if that those have been considered to try to send people a safer route. And then just a comment to question is uh, the $1.6 million, I just feel like this project being rejected by the homeowners that where the sidewalk would be is really big for me. And I kind of just wonder if there's just some more markings or like a pedestrian chalk walk a chalk like sign just showing that like pedestrians are on this block be careful sort of thing maybe greater enforcement but I, I don't really feel the strong need for sidewalks there as much as I do for stormwater so I, I feel very supportive of stormwater not so much of sidewalks yeah, so real quick, Carly. So that is a conversation, that's a policy conversation for the council. I mean, it's, it's, what All we'll right, tell yeah. you is we've heard both. We've heard some neighbors want park with sidewalks and some don't. And the direction we had to going into design was to go ahead and incorporate the pedestrian safety component into it. So really, if there's a discussion about whether it go stays or goes, this is a values discussion amongst the council for its mobility of the, the community, not a technical issue for staff. Um, yeah, so I directed towards council that I, I just think the sidewalks and the cost of $1.6 million, which some of that, I guess, is toward, it's yeah, what, what percentage just goes towards stormwater and what is just the sidewalk? I didn't break it out, but I would say 80, 90 percent is probably stormwater. Okay. The stormwater budget is $1.27 million. Okay, so it's still a good chunk, but I, I still sympathize with the owners of the properties that are against this uh, sidewalk, especially since they come from multiple people on Park Avenue. Uh, any other any other comments or, or, or well I just think that um, there are some simpler solutions that could be implemented to just recognize that pedestrians walk on that one block rather than having to put in sidewalks which 
are against what the people in these letters are advocating for. Um, it does change the neighborhood in a way that I think detracts from what uh, Aspen is about in some ways, especially when we're talking about a garden that like Elizabeth Papke used to be famous for. So I, I just would not support the sidewalks on this block, but would prefer maybe speed limit enforcement or just greater signage of that pedestrians are on this road too, maybe even a line on the road saying this is where like pedestrians are gonna be, something like that, something much simpler rather than like physical sidewalks that I don't think are necessary. Okay, yeah. thanks for that. John? Yeah, just a quick reminder from engineering. <clears throat> how much of the sidewalk will be in the city's right of way and how much will be on private property? The entire sidewalk is in the right of way we have an easement with 325 Park Avenue, um, also known as the Triangle House, for five square feet of roadway on that property. Thank you, yeah. I appreciate that. Ford? Yeah, several things. Um, <clears throat> I go back to 2019 meeting with Adam Frisch of the neighborhood, uh, people in the neighborhood about this, so I've been involved in this since the resurrection of this project. Um, we have at the council table had lengthy discussions about one way in doing midway, Midland and Park different ways. Uh, and it, it became really apparent that all of the people, it seems, along Park Avenue have uh, landscape put uh, their own dollars into landscaping on city property. And that uh, having an objection that it's uh, um, using my land is has no validity because it's not their land. If you look at um, 325 and 355, I look at it on Google Maps, they come up at the same same location, that speed bump, or the uh, triangle house, which actually shows that it's uh, it comes out into to the roadway. Um, and that is a real pinch point right through that area where the, uh, where it's, uh, the Triangle House is, and that's across the street is where the additional sidewalk is going to be to, to hook up the, uh, the, the missing link. So there, um, I am supportive of both the stormwater and the uh, pedestrian. I know that it's a really uh, highly used area. I know that uh, um, Warrant studies have shown that it uh, doesn't um, increase safety by putting a slower speed limit or speed bumps. Speed bumps actually increase uh, the noise and people speed up after the speed bumps. So we've looked at all these things over the last um, 15 three years. years. Yeah, well, just recently. In that um, um, both Sam and Bill are asking for a lighter touch. We've looked at that over the years and um, we would in, um, invite both Bill and uh, Sam to look at the uh, past uh, work sessions and studies that are uh, noted in the packet. Um, there was one, let's see if I can find it in the packet, about um, a, a, new, a new area for stormwater treatment. Um, and that's subgrade. So my question is, if that's a, a, a new and untested, uh, is there going to be, are you going, are we going to have to um, get silt and um, sediment out of that area? Like we have to at some of the holding ponds in uh, uh, Ginny Adair and some of the other, and even up at um, Thomas Reservoir, we have to um, strain out and remove some of that. Is So um, not sure what that's, that, that new innovation is for stormwater treatment? Sure, it's called a CDS vault. It's um, made by Contec, and it's a completely subgrade. It's rather than a pond that is visible as you're walking by, it's entirely in a concrete vault. Um, it's an eight foot diameter vault that would go under that trail. Um, we've got a handful of them in town. Truscott has one. Um, I think there's one on Neil. Or by the yellow yellow break, I believe has one. Um, Cycle Center might have one, or somewhere right over there. Yeah. So we've got um, we're familiar with the maintenance required. So it doesn't requ it does require some maintenance, but it doesn't require that you excavate to get into the subgrade area. 
Exactly. Okay. Um, there was a question that I had also on, uh, is, is, I mean, stormwater treatment is important and the drainage is important, I think, um, both reflected in the, the budget and uh, the comments at this table, uh, that there's an, and I'm not sure what this is, um, a project as an add alt to the bid um, that's on, uh, what is it, on page 186. What is, what is that? It seems like if that's a uh, uh, drainage and uh, that it, it seems to be important for the project, if a high, high degree of uh, desire for drainage and stormwater treatment. The project scope initially was just the northern block of Park Avenue, not looking at the East Hopkins Trail. As we sat down with neighbors, many of the neighbors had concerns about drainage on that trail, um, in particular icing issues. The adult uh, portion of this project would be regrading the trail with the cross slope and grading a swale in along the side of the trail. Um, it's an adult because it wasn't part of the original project scope. Yeah, I would encourage that to be part of this, not as an option. Um, I think that it, you get pooling down there in the, in the winter time, it becomes really slick. Um, and um, question on uh, five, or 315, 317, I know there have been some concerns about it uh, directing stormwater into that area. Um, you, you, you mentioned in the, the memo that there's a crowning that's be, being done on the road and it sounds as though the, the water is going to be redirected to the east and hit stormwater drainage to, uh, I'm just curious what the um, impact is going to be on the 317, 315 uh, duplex. Sure. So. The, the drainage basins that drain to Park Avenue all come from the east and the northeast. Um, right now, Park Avenue is graded with a consistent cross slope from the west, uh, sorry, from the east to the west. So everything that comes from the east side of Park Avenue drains across the street. There's an existing low point um, just south of 315, 317's property. There's um, a shocking amount of water in a hundred year storm that goes onto their private property. This project, uh, we would introduce a crown in the road and curb and gutter to capture and channelize that water into the inlets that we'd install in the gutter line um, along Park Avenue, so there'd be four inlets proposed. Um, in a very large storm, water will still follow that existing flow path. There is still a low point in our design in the event that we see a 100 year storm water will overtop the crown and follow the existing flow path. But in um, smaller storms, <coughs> it's captured in the storm system and won't overtop that crown. So with the, the proposed work, with the addition of the at all, that would take care of the uh, pooling uh, on the east side of the walking bridge? Seems like on the northeast side of the walking bridge, there's a collection point. Bottom, bottom of East Hopkins Trail. We do in the adult. In the adult, yeah. So. Are you talking about the bridge itself? Are you talking about right at the bridge? That one spot, like, like as it comes into the bridge right there? Yeah. Or are you talking about the hill? No, I'm talking at the bottom of the hill. When yeah. You, when you come over the bridge, if you're coming towards away from town, it's on your left. That that seems to be a good, a, a lot of water pools there. Is this gonna take care of that? Yeah, so right now the trail has a low spot in it just to the east of the bridge, like you're saying. The adult is the flattening and uh, creating a gradual increase rather than a low spot and then a steep increase in slope. Good. And to go back one step, on the drainage piece that Carly just described, one important <coughs> piece of capturing that stormwater is the curb um, because you need to build head in order to get it into an inlet. So whether you do the sidewalk or not, we'll have to, if you exclude a sidewalk from the project, it gets a little more complicated on how you capture that stormwater a little bit with the road there, because you don't, of course, want to push it to the east. So the curb plays a role in drainage, for sure. Just 
I want to make that clear. Yeah, we had a, a project on King Street. I think we probably had about six hours of discussion on a one block section, but for the curb and drain, I think that is taking care of that um, to my knowledge. And hopefully this will take care of this other pooling and drainage area in that immediate area. So I would encourage that the add all be um, added as a part of the program. Um, well, uh, Ward, are you making a request uh, that impacts what they need to come back to us with? Well, it's, it's as an adult now, and we're asking for direction if we want to proceed, and I would like to proceed with it uh, as presented. And, uh, yeah, I think that, ta that that pooling on that particular point should be part of this uh, project. If you're going to be doing it, probably won't get back to it for another 40 or 50 years, so let's do it now. So it's just a bit of an add to that. Um, I don't think there's been a uh, bid process for this. At least the um, memo doesn't indicate that. Um, so there's a budget of 1.6. I'd like to see that uh, add all added to that um, um, RFP. What what would be your response? Yes, that's no problem. We'll do it. Or um, we need we need two other council members to agree with that, or this is going to move the budget up uh, several hundred. That, where are we? I just want to make sure that this is. Yeah, it may, it, what the adult does is let us say how close is it to meeting our, our anticipated budget, and if it doesn't come in with that, you certainly have the option to make appropriations out of your asset management fund balance to make that go forward. Um, the probability of the current budget having that within scope is just, um, uh, an unknown given today's volatility of construction pricing. Uh, one of the things we're hopeful with with the 2024 construction is that we can be pretty far ahead uh, in, in a bid process uh, to have that work to advantage of the community. But it, it really is council's pleasure about whether you want all of that work done together um, or we're going to evaluate it and make a recommendation to you based upon the pricing uh, and the complexity of how it affects the project overall when it came back to you for approval of a construction contract if we were given the green light. Okay. All right. So from your nods, I take it that you'll look at that as part of the scope? Okay. Is that okay with the rest? Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I'm, I'm not particularly excited about this in general. So right, right, right. I'm, I'm just uncomfortable with it. I have one more question if that's okay. okay. Um, has there been a pedestrian or a biker accident on this block of ho uh, uh, park? Sorry. There is not. So turning back to council, I, I totally respect the uh, public right of way not belonging to the property owner is the public right of way. Yep. But I also feel like I hate the feeling of the rug being pulled out from under someone when you have beautiful gardens and beautiful trees being ripped up and removed for the sake that we have not had a problem here in the first place, costing us taxpayer dollars to fix something that I believe personally and totally understand that's been looked at with a lighter touch and that that's just my opinion. I totally re understand and respect everyone else's, but with yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I walk by, th I <coughs> live in the area and I it looked at it today and it looks like the biggest um, Removal is going to be a lilac bush that's right on uh, on park, and it doesn't look like there are a lot. There are any um, private improvements in the right of way in the section that is being proposed for uh, sidewalk addition. Um, I mention that because uh, we had extensive discussions about all of um, park <coughs> and Midland, and if you walk that, ride that, drive it, you'll see that uh, right up to the curb, right up to the pavement, there are uh, private landscaping. Um, but the, this, we're only talking about a couple of block section here, and um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I don't think that there are any permanent landscaping um, improvements that have been done in that area other than losing that big lilac tree. Well, I, I'm not sure that's right, and what is permanent? I mean. One of the things he's well, talking about. Along the garden. street, you'll see what's permanent, where they put in a lot of landscaping. When they put, uh, have you walked the area? Have you 
many times. Well, then you'll know what permanent is, where, where they've put in improvements. Those aren't permanent improvements. They've been put in on the right-of-way. It's their own dollars they've put in on, uh, on the right-of-way. I mean, there's no adverse possession. It's a city right-of-way. It I, belongs I to the totally city. I totally understand the technicality, but I don't think it's right. I think, it's, I think that there are significant both non-permanent, like landscaping type of things, and permanent, like walkways and driveways, or semi-permanent, whatever you want to categorize. I don't know what the technical terms are, but I think there are many of those things that will be affected as part of this project. <coughs> is, is that not correct? It's, would you like to answer? You want to? The aesthetic was the number one thing from Park Avenue for five years. That has been key. So this whole project was designed about not only functioning, but with that aesthetic in mind. And so when we're talking about impacts, we're talking about kind of four scrubby trees that were already deemed by the forester as being aged and in trouble. There is one tree that is a pretty tree that we are, but we're also working with the homeowners to replace anything that they'd like to see that would improve the aesthetics. So it is a little bit, it's not like we're going in there and we're ripping out everything, all of their vegetation and stuff. That's not what this is like. We are doing this with like a the minimal touch because that is the number one comment you hear from Park right. Avenue. And so as Carly has said, she has sat down with the homeowners like directly impacted. They know, they understand the pieces um, and we've seen the emails, but you know, but, you but got just to, to be crystal clear, Pete, there are there impacts are. to improvements yes. made adjacent to private property in the right of way that range from driveway to walkway to landscaping, more than just one lilac bush. There, more than, yeah, there's like four minimal, like lilac, uh, there's kind of a scrub tree. And there's a larger tree. I mean, we can. But there's also driveways that are going to change. There is a, one driveway that does get adjusted by a percentage. Okay. Um, sure, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to say this is looking at the title Safety and Stormwater Improvement Project. I'm really happy that all of us here see the value of improving the stormwater treatment there. Uh, I'm concerned about safety. I don't think we should wait until there's an accident to make these improvements. I also think since we're focused on mobility, this will not only help pedestrian mobility, it will make bicycling safer in this, in this neighborhood. Not in the, just in the summer, but also in the winter. I know dozens of people who live in that neighborhood and, and uh, carry their bikes on, carry their skis on their e-bikes over to the gondola. This is a huge improvement and I fully support this as it stands, thanks. Thanks, John. Uh, a couple questions for you. Um, do you know the current width of the roadway? Yes. And I know it varies, but but what what is it kind of in a typical? Yeah. So throughout the corridor on the southbound lane, it's approximately ten point seven five feet. So ten feet nine inches. Uh, sorry, south. Yeah, southbound, and the northbound lane varies between 10, 10 feet three inches and eleven feet and three inches. So, uh, twenty one inches. Uh, sorry, twenty one feet. And um, what would this, as proposed and as designed here, what does this return those two lanes to, widthwise? Ten point five feet each. So twenty one feet. So. Already somewhat on the... 21.5 is existing. So it's a reduction of six inches. So it's it's currently operating. I think, what, 12 is kind of 12-foot uh, lane widths? Is that kind of what we like or work off of in certain circumstance? Yeah, 11 to 12 feet. So this is slightly below... Uh, ideal or max build out, if you will. We we probably wouldn't go over. So so we're so we're already on this the skinny side of that. Um, uh, let's see. I'm going to go through this quickly because ultimately um, I'm going to support this when it comes back. But I get what these guys are saying, and you know I asked years ago about um, the curb type that you were even going to use. I think it's a full curb, and we had talked about like. Is it possible to use a, a transition curb or a rolled curb, whatever they're called? 
Um, as Sam was just saying, well, could we, instead of making a full-blown sidewalk, could we just uh, stripe it at grade and not make it a raised sidewalk? There's different reasons. Pete just said that uh, the cur curb actually helps with controlling that, the runoff and the, and the water flow. Um, but is there anything else that prevents us from doing, you know, what they're talking about, a lighter touch or a softer touch or uh, making sure that this design, and the reason I'm asking this again is because the rendering that you showed us is a lovely rendering, but it's a really pleasant, you know, pencil drawing or something that that isn't, doesn't really get to the, the real texture of how it's going to look, right? Um, and so I'm, as I always wonder, and what these guys are supporting is to do this as minimally as possible. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, I can't tell from that what that curb treatment is actually. Is that at grade or is it a actual curb? Yeah, so this, it, it's not shown fully in this rendering. Um, this is really meant to be more conceptual, but the curb, there'll be two different curb types depending on the portion of roadway. Um, in all cases where you have vehicle access to property, so in driveways, and then there's a couple, really one mainly, uh, private um, parallel parking behind the sidewalk. We have a 10 to 1 ratio mountable curb, and so it's um, even more gentle than our typical mountable curb detail that we see in town. And that was something that we worked closely with neighbors on to um, find a solution that would work for them and their vehicles. And that was also because we heard you say publicly in a council work session specific to that curb. I appreciate it. And, and you know, again, this is what I would say, and, and I don't know if Bill and Sam want to chime in, but, you know, if that was the finished project, um, uh, that is something that does look pleasant, that does maintain some of the character and is kind of a lighter touch. So if, if, if that, I mean, to me, that looks like success. So if it was to come out like that, you know, I don't know how you feel about it, but that to me is uh, respectful of the character of this roadway. Um, uh, Sam, I will tell you, I've actually been um, in somebody's house on this street watching uh, pedestrian traffic, because um, we've talked about this for a couple years and I had the opportunity to just go observe. And um, oftentimes just because uh, 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 an accident isn't reported or uh, logged doesn't mean there aren't conflicts. And in this area, um, and I think Bill knows this from going through there, there's conflict. There's vehicle and pedestrian conflict, without a doubt. Um, I was uh, originally in favor of trying the one weighing of Park and Midland, um, but um, after... Uh, yes, and Ward was as, as well. Uh, but after... Um, being up there uh, so many times, and you as well, during this last campaign, were through that area. If you remember this winter, Midland was a mess. Um, unpassable for certain vehicles, as a matter of fact. So I, I've had to kind of adjust. I've talked to the neighbors here. Um, to my surprise, uh, many of the neighbors that are on the side where the sidewalk will be put in uh, are in favor of it. Um, and I, the reason I say surprise is because um, they recognize that this sidewalk is going to get closer to their homes than the edge of the roadway is now, and they're even they're still supportive of it, which was interesting to me. Um, so I'm going to finalize here just because I want to move on, but I agree with what these guys said about the light touch, about respecting that character and the, and the feel of that roadway while making the stormwater and safety improvements. And I think you guys have heard that loud and clear. Uh, if it looks like that rendering, I think that that would be success. My only last question or point here is this is one small stretch. From this, from this, east side Park Avenue sidewalk addition being put in, it doesn't connect to another sidewalk as we go up because the vacant residences of the Park Avenue apartment complex um, kind of have an unknown future, but I'm sure that that is one of those that upon redevelopment is required to put curb and gutter or sidewalks in, in front of it. What's interesting about that is that, again, will just be that segment. You then have older properties that are further up park that are not 
slated for redevelopment anytime soon. So there's no more sidewalk on either side of park until you get to the new affordable housing units um, that the city put in. Uh, uh, there's a little bit, there's a little stretch there, but I don't think there's a piece from on that, on that east side. There's continuous sidewalk on the west side. On the Although west side. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, not on the east side. And the, the, there, there are not current plans to have continuous sidewalk on the east side. Okay. So the intent is for people to cross with that Park Avenue apartments or great. when that. Yeah, great. That's what I was wondering is it won't, it won't continue on the east. You'll get to the Midland and Park intersection and cross intersection, get to the other side for continuous sidewalk. Great. Um, we, I just, for the record, um, uh, even in this work session, I just want to acknowledge that we received an email today from uh, Nina Eisenstadt. One of the letters uh, that we've received in the past has been from John Prunskis. Um, and so just to acknowledge that public input that we've received those letters as well. That's all the comments I have. Like I said, I, I intend to support this. I do, you know, want to see the design reflective of what you've heard at the table, but that's all I've got for it. I think where I'm struggling, continue to struggle on this, is part of it is being new to this conversation, of course, and not something that I've paid attention to for many years. But this feels like something that generally would come, would be desired by the neighborhood first. Um, you know, I also live in a neighborhood that has poor drainage and had, you know, particularly last winter had a ton of rutting and, and bumpiness to it. And, and so I sort of just view that as part of Aspen and, and I'm okay with that. Um, I, there's also no continuous sidewalk in my neighborhood and there's a ton of pedestrian and, and bicycle traffic through my little neighborhood from the, uh, bus stop that goes to the 8th street bus stop over to Hopkins. Um. I, I get this sort of diligent engineering approach of what's being proposed here, and I think it's probably the, the correct engineering approach for an urban environment. It, it just may, you know, I'm super uncomfortable with the fact that there are so many neighbors that and, and property owners there that don't like this and are, are so opposed to it. So, yeah, I've I'm not going to proclaim myself as an expert of whether I think it's the right solution or the wrong solution and what the specific approach is right or wrong. I just uh, am very uncomfortable with the fact that it's not getting a lot of neighborhood support. Bless you. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I totally hear you. That's why we've been talking about this for 15 plus years. Um, you know, we've all struggled with it. Um, I've, you know, had to, uh, you know, make sure that the decisions that we're making are in pursuit of the values that we're, we're pursuing. So I, I, I get what you're saying. Um, I guess the only thing I'd say is that, you know, in a couple of the cases that you're talking about, um, the, the property owners objections to this are solely based on the impacts to them. Right. So, so I have to keep in mind what is, best for my community and not a singular property owner. Uh, I also have to recognize that um, they've known and for a long time that their improvements, their gardens, their trees are um, in the right of way. Um, and, you know, I, like, like I said, this is, this is a, I, I'm not for a do nothing option here. I, I've seen the conflict here. This is a, this is not just a pedestrian corridor. It's a transit corridor. Um, so I, I hear you, man. Um, this is one of those decisions that, that, uh, can give you heartburn. Um, and we have a, a talented staff that is going to do the best to, to, to be as gentle as possible to, to, uh, restore as much of the, uh, lovely vegetation and give as much respect as they can. But in, at the end of the day, I mean, this is a situation that I, I it does need improvement. And, and like I said, shared with you, um, there are many there are many residents over there that do support this and and I even was talking about a few that I reached out to that I was surprised but they were like yes I'm willing uh, I'm willing to lose some of the right of way that I've been using as my so there are even people in that condition that are like you know I 
I don't like this being three feet closer to my house, but you know what? This is the best for this condition. So I, I have to listen to some of those, those residents as well. Yeah, I, I appreciate that perspective. The one thing that I don't think is totally fair, uh, particularly with respect to Nina, who, who I know, um, is that it's not just about how it's going to affect the right of way immediately adjacent to their property. I don't think that's fair to say that all the criticism comes from that. I didn't. I you, said some. Okay, but but I think we want to be clear that you know I, I think what this doesn't address, which is another one of my concerns, is is speeding. I mean, I don't know how this is going to deal with speeding, which seems to be a major concern of of residents on Park. Um, I don't think it really addresses, and it should bicycle safety. I mean, we're actually narrowing the roadway, not widening it. So yes, we move the pedestrians off of the roadway, but there's not a dedicated bike corridor. We're not really enhancing bicycle safety. Um, you know, we're not talking about s speed bumps. We're not talking about traffic <coughs> calming measures, really. We're not talking about adding stop signs. We're not talking about any of these things that um, I think should be discussed in concert that really most of the residents that I've talked to that are there, that's their bigger concern. It's not, they're not so worried, and they live and breathe it and, and watch it every day what's happening there. I'm sure that they are concerned about pedestrian safety, but their primary concern is just cars moving too quickly in front of their property. So I think that's worth considering, too. Well, we did install a stop sign, which um, slows cars down considerably. Um, so uh, we, have, we have worked on that some. I appreciate your comments, and I appreciate you representing for those members of the community. Um, I think with that, you have a majority of council that is prepared to see this come back. You also have some questions and comments that maybe you could address when you do come back for um, budget time and, and such. But may have one parting comment. You may. Um, survey shows that 67.9% uh, of the people in the neighborhood support pursuing the design of a sidewalk connection where two-way traffic is maintained on park. 66% were against um, doing a mobility lab, if we <laughs> can refer to calling it a mobility lab. People were not supportive of uh, testing it out. And 69.1% were against the one-way, so yeah. There's, uh, there's community support for what's proposed here. Thanks, Ward. Thank you, guys. Any other questions or clarifications you need from us? Thank you. So I'm going to summarize then that we're to go forward with, as presented in the work uh, in the packet, with the alternate ad uh, for the additional work. We will keep the sidewalk and we will maintain two-way traffic. We're, where we'll, what we'll staff will be doing over the next several months is finishing up design and then going to bid for 2024 construction. And all of you um, were part of the vote that authorized that funding earlier uh, in May. Thank you. My, my one requested addition, if I don't know if there's other support for this or not, but my one requested addition would be to also incorporate some traffic calming measures if we're going to go forward with this. Um. I think we should revisit it. I think you, you should hear about some of the information that's been brought forward about different things, whether it's ta uh, speed tables, whether it's additional stop signs, signage, and the like. Um, I, I would support that they have that available to them in their scope. And if they, wanna, if they, if they think that there are opportunities for, then I, I support that. I, I wouldn't at right now say, hey, give us a speed table here or a speed table there. Or, but I would say, hey, I'm definitely looking at uh, uh, traffic calming or slowing, if you will. Um, and like I said, we did do the stop sign, which is a big step forward there. But if there's other, if there's other items, whether it's the crosswalk that will be developed at Park and Midland may be an opportunity for, you know, anytime you stripe a crosswalk, people are more cognizant and aware that it's a pedestrian crossing. Maybe that's something that helps. So if there's anything along those lines, if there's another council member that supports giving our team the, the ability to look at other traffic slowing uh, opportunities, then 
then they can put that you've in been, there. You've been on board with this from the beginning. Have, have we looked at, Carly, Trish, have, have we looked at previously and discussed cough, uh, traffic calming measures uh, in this discussion up to this point? For this section of roadway, because the 85th percentile is 21 miles an hour, which is, you know, pretty close to our posted speed limit, we ha there there's really not to get it much lower than that. I haven't been in, I haven't been successful in getting speeds lower than 20 miles an hour as far as like without severe um, measures that would that would make it unsafe for emergency vehicle, emergency access, and then bikes themselves. I'm talking about like severe, you know, speed bumps, bumps. and tables. And I mean, <laughs> tables, you know, those, those are meant to get people down, you know, down below 25. But once you try and go below 20 um, for a measure, I, I, I have not been able to find something that would be safe. And has there been a warrant study along this section? Yeah, and like I said, it's it doesn't warrant uh, doesn't warrant it. Yeah, if we've had a warrant study, I, I wouldn't support going back on it, go revisiting it. Could you share a little bit of what the eighty-five percentile means, and it's a industry standard, and, and yeah. some things like that? Because to the common resident, they're not going to know what that means. Thank you. I'm taking the steam out of the next presentation. Um, we do have a traffic and transportation engineer here that studied this topic extensively in the West End, but I will, I will go ahead and um, take some of his steam. So 85 percentile, that is the speed at which most people are traveling. Now, there's gonna be people above 85 percentile, you know, that, that are gonna go fast no matter what. No matter what you do, they don't, they don't care about police, they don't care about it, they're gonna go fast. But 85 percent, that's the majority of people's speeds, that's what they're traveling at. And that's what we found in this corridor, is the majority of people, it, it, in this part of the corridor. Now, you, you section it off, and you go on the lower side of park, you know, below, uh, Hopkins Avenue, they are traveling. They're traveling, they come off of Main Street, for some reason they're going 30 miles an hour. Like, you know, on the section going up, which I, that's another, but anyhow, for this section, it, it's, it's, it's a 21. Other sections of a park, it's, it is a different story, but for this section, it's not. I, I think the 15% is what the residents are reacting to. So I get the metric, um, but how do you address the 15%? There's got to be something that's effective and safe. Okay, again, I'm taking away from the next presentation. Uh, so what, what, what they've found is that, so for that, that extra, that, that 15%, is, is, yeah, additional signing. So signs, again, signs are not necessarily going to affect the 85%, but it does affect that 15%. So... If you and I don't, I don't know that we have. I don't know what the type of signing that we have out there. We do have signing. Not on the speeding side. Yeah. So, so that signing, you know, could help that fifteen percent. Now, I wouldn't advocate that signing, you know, solves all your issues, but it, it could help for that fifteen percent. And so that would be my support for Bill's suggestion, just to give this team the ability to say, hey, you know, we think we should put a sign. A reminder: slow speed zone or something. Uh, that's all. I'm, that's all I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, flashing light sign kind of thing. Oh, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting specifics. I'm. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm not a traffic engineer, but I, I think that is what people are asking for. And even if they're wrong, I think we should give them some of what they're asking for. Anyway, if there's support for just uh, allowing them to think about signage or whatever to affect the 15 percent. Yes. Absolutely. All right. You have that in your tool belt. All right. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Your hard work. And it's Thank crazy you. how such a small segment of roadway can be a 15 plus year discussion, but okay. it has been. Well, how about King Street? My, my, <laughs> that, entire, that was rough my too. entire career. Yeah. Been yeah. Working on Park Avenue. Um, all right, well, let's talk more traffic. Uh, I'll have to walk. No, well, um. <coughs> um. 
Scott will be presenting over there. Mm -hmm. um, here are the notes. Oh, you will. Okay. Um, and and I, ne I need a restroom break. Is Go right ahead. Thank you for asking. Wait a minute, did you get the hall pass? Be be better than watching her squirm. <laughs> You don't want me no, to I don't know. angry. I don't know what made me think it as well, but <laughs> I'm just underprepared. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor and City Council. Today we are presenting the West End Neighborhood Safety Improvement Assessment. My name is Trish Aragon, I'm the City Engineer, and with me today I have Pete Rice, the Deputy City Engineer, and then we also have, yes, uh, we have Kim Ferber, the uh, City, <laughs> the um, Police Chief, and Bill Lynn, the Assistant Police Chief here uh, to help with any conversations regarding enforcement. Um, we also have Scott Berger here at the table from Consor Engineers. He's a traffic and transportation engineer that has performed this safety improvement assessment and he will be presenting the results of the assessment today. Now, before Scott begins his presentation, I want to describe or take a moment to describe how we got there. So, the city has been working on ways to improve traffic and safety in the West End for, for many years. In reviewing this history, the city has implemented close to 20 programs, projects, and campaigns <coughs> over the last 18 years, many of which have been successful in reducing traffic volumes. Uh, when we look at July, over July traffic year over year, we are seeing the lowest volume in traffic in, in 20 years. This does not include 2020 during COVID. In addition to improving traffic volumes, we've been successful in improving pedestrian and bike safety in the West End with the implementation of our ped bike ways on Hallam and on Lake Street, or Lake Avenue. And uh, we did install some additional stop signs as requested by council from our last work session in August. Additionally, with feedback from the West End community, we have increased enforcement. We've de deployed uh, a radar trailer and implemented a community watch program. However, without increasing the capacity of Main Street or installing physical infrastructure such as sidewalks, we're limited to how much impact we can have on the West End. Last fall, we presented the results from the traffic study that was performed in this area. The recommendation from the study concluded that any physical traffic measures installed in the West End neighborhood would significantly, or would either, um, would either be ineffective in reducing traffic or um, it would significantly impact the main street traffic. Making the, and this would make our transportation system completely ineffective, resulting in traffic operations that would really be unacceptable to the community. This includes affecting our bus system and our um, emergency services. It would be similar 
to the effect that we had on last year's detour in the community. As a result, council asked to increase support of projects to manage traffic and mobility, such as the entrance to Aspen, parking management, transportation demand um, management, and pedestrian and bike master plan projects, most of which is included in council's new goal of transportation. Additionally, council supported development of Main Street capacity or efficiency concepts such as looking at the cemetery lane traffic light efficiency, and that's included in the department's 2024 work plan. Lastly, council asked that we investigate how the West End can be made safer by looking at potential traffic devices such as four-way stops, crosswalks, and um, speed limit reductions. Today's presentation is focusing on recommendations on solutions that can improve safety in the West End without significantly changing the traffic operations or shifting traffic volumes to other areas of the city. You can do the next slide. So today's presentation is gonna follow this format. We're gonna look at existing operations, look at uh, potential uh, traffic measures um, to be, that could be implemented in the West End and evaluate those alternatives and then look at next steps. The next steps that we'll be discussing or going through, um, and we'll be, we'll be presenting this at the end of the presentation, but I wanted to give you a preview of those potential next steps. So that's speed limit reductions, additional stop signs, additional crosswalks, um, additional speed limit signs, and pave marking for flexible um, delineators, and then also adding, adding in. Yeah, we had speed limit last time. Okay, oh, okay. <laughs> um, pedestrian uh, walkways, um, temporary pedestrian walkways, similar to what's on 4th Street. So, before we get, before Scott gets into his presentation, I wanted to, to talk about the existing traffic operations and how it works in the West End. So, although this presentation isn't focused on traffic volumes, wanted to, to explain what's happening in the West End as far as traffic. So this graph shows the AM and PM peaks in the West End. The red line is the AM peak and the blue line is the PM peak. Now this is at Smuggler and A Street. And this, this one shows you know, close to 600 vehicles, and we've seen, we've seen the 600 vehicles. We've seen anywhere from 600 to 650 vehicles per hour during that peak PM period. And when, I, when I say peak, I'm, I'm, ta I'm gonna look at one hour, the, the highest hour, and that's between, between four and five PM approximately. So this represents 35% of the traffic that is trying to exit town during that PM peak. During that PM peak, the S curves are restriction point because only 1,200 vehicles per hour can get through them. Once, once traffic volumes start to get up to around 700 vehicles per hour in the west or in the S curves, that's when traffic starts to look for other ways to get out of town. And that's when it starts to back up to about 4th Street, and that's where people are looking, looking, um, looking to areas like the West End to exit in, out of town. Um, so I'll let Scott uh, present his, his, his assessment and his, um, sure. his study. Yes, I'm Scott Berger. Uh, I'm a professional engineer and a professional traffic operations engineer. So, uh, basis that's based on experience, and I have continuing education units to get every three years. Um, I've been a transportation engineer for 34 years, with uh, 14 of those on the traffic side and, and, and a variety of other aspects of, of uh, transportation for the others. Uh, the I-70 programmatic environmental impact statement that went from Denver to Glenwood Springs. Uh, I headed up the, the traffic and transportation planning effort on that for about five years. Uh, 
I worked on a project in Glenwood Canyon back when I was doing bridge engineering. But um, I've currently got studies going on in Steamboat and some past work at Copper Mountain related to freeway congestion that they were having problems with. So anyways, um, so here's the previously alluded to 85% uh, example. So um, it's, it's a national standard. Um, it kind of just ties what people feel they should be going to what the speed limit is, as opposed to imposing something that feels completely unnatural on them. So that's kind of the basic input. It's not like the only factor that goes into the speed limit, but it's kind of a general principle. So this is obviously not in, in uh, Aspen. This is just from a FHWA publication, but but here you see 85% of the vehicles are going less than the 85th percentile. 15% are going higher. Um, so in this case, the uh, 85th percentile is uh, 58, and the average is 52. So that'd be like the 50th percentile. So anyways, and the standard deviation is just how much variation you have between the fast and the slow cars within that pack of traffic. So um, one of the referred ideas um, that we lo we're looking at is, uh, let's hold on, I can see it up there. Uh, so uh, is, is the notion of dropping the speed limit from 20 to 15 in the West End. Um, there was speed data collected in <coughs> July and August of 2022. It basically showed there wasn't a, much of a problem with speeding. But uh, first we'll start with the example of Power Plant Road. Um, and the general notion is that a reasonable driver will drive at the speed suggested by the roadway and traffic conditions. Not, they'll take into account the speed limit, but it doesn't, it's not the predominant big, uh, factor in their speed. So on Power Plant Road, we have, it's narrow. Um, I think it's about 20 feet wide. Uh, it's got sharp curves. It's got a 50 foot radii at three different locations. And that is a design speed of 15 miles an hour. And, uh, and it's got steep grades, both going into it and out of it. So as you can see, that has a speed limit of 15 miles an hour. And that's an example of something where a 15 mile an hour speed limit is warranted and appropriate. Um, then we come to the, uh, the West End. And the most common uh, width is, is 40 feet for um, the pavement width. It's got parallel parking on both sides. Um, your average car is about six and a half feet wide. You take one of those off each side and your width for travel is about 27 feet. Compare that to 20 feet on Power Plant Road. Um, kind of hard to tell what the design speed is because there are no curves. It's, it's basically generally flat, straight. So there aren't geomet geometric features that would indicate to people they should be um, going as slow as, as we are studying. Um, and I just want to make sure there's, uh, there's a distinction between what's the posted speed limit and the actual or observed speed. So just because you drop a speed limit doesn't mean you could drop the speed limit five miles an hour. It doesn't mean people will go five miles an hour slower. So, um, okay. And so um, we, a lot of our, our study was, um, we did a lot of research uh, looking for sources uh, where these things had been studied. We studied, um, we looked for before and after studies. We found dozens of studies. We did not find any where anybody studied dropping the speed limit to 15 miles an hour. We found 30 to 25. We found some 20 to 20, 25 to 20, but we didn't find any that, that studied uh, what would happen in that instance. Um, so kind of a major study in this area that's been cited many times since is this Garber and Gadiru study. And then they state accident rates increase with increasing speed variance for all classes of roads. So uh, if we drop the speed limit in the West End from 20 to 15, um, most drivers wouldn't feel that was something they should be doing. Uh, so we would get more variance between some that would pay more attention to the speed limit and others that, that wouldn't. 
and would feel that that wasn't um, the appropriate thing for them to do. So you're going to get more speed variance, and with more speed variance, it actually you, you anticipate it would decrease safety rather than increase safety. Um, and so you know, we'd expect decreased compliance, increased speed variance. Um, So the pros of reducing the speed limit, if actual reductions in speed were obtained, then the likelihood and severity of crashes would, um, likelihood would decrease, severity would decrease. But then again, uh, there's charts of survivability and uh, severity of crashes, and 20s already on the rather low end. Um, as you get up into speeds like 30, 40, you, your likelihood of a pedestrian surviving that impact drops dramatically. But uh, down to 20, it's um, rather low on the end of the severity um, spectrum. And 15 would be lower, but, but not by a lot. Cons, um, reducing speed limits doesn't guarantee driver compliance. Increased uh, speed variance, would, we would expect, would decrease safety. Um, the cost uh, of this would be rather minimal. Um, there are not many speed limit signs in the West End. There's some, uh, something in the neighborhood, five or six of them. So the largest part of this would be mobilization, but order up some speed limit signs, put them on the same post. Um, it would be a rather inexpensive alternative, but it's one that we, uh, we don't recommend. <coughs> the next alternative uh, that we looked at, um, increased four-way stop control. So if you look at this map, you see there's an awful lot of stop signs in the West End. There's 13 existing all-way stop sign controlled intersections, 18 that, that uh, are two-way, um, which surprised me. You know, I, I looked at it at a glance, and it seemed like most of them were for four ways, but there's a number of them that are that are two ways, and there's some reasons for that. Um, preference for bike pedways. I think coming off of Main Street, the desire was to have that be free flow for a block, so that that doesn't back into Main Street and cause uh, safety issues for cars and pedestrians there. So, so there are negative impacts from unwarranted or quote, nuisance stop signs. Um, drivers intentionally violate the stop signs. Those that do stop and increase speed following the stop sign to make up for the perceived lost time. Um, there is more noise and air pollution from rapid starts and stops. And um, the governing document for all of these things um, for, for engineering design is the uh, Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Design. And it talks about the functions of stop signs, striping. Um, so stop signs they, they should not be used for speed control. Their function is to mitigate conflict at intersections and give some priority to one direction or the other. So we already have an existing high density of stop signs, but that hasn't deterred vehicles um, from passing through the West End during congested periods, as we've talked about. Um, Placement of additional four-way stop signs around parks could improve safety for vulnerable users. We found three locations around parks where um, there's not a uh, four-way stop sign configuration. But then again, um, these are all rather small parks. Um, if you looked at a warrant analysis, the pedestrian volumes would likely be relatively low. Also, there's a picture of the uh, yellow brick building um, the yellow brick building and the red brick building have um, four-way stop signs around most of the corners. So there's also an emphasis on that, parks and schools, former school buildings. So pros and cons, stop signs helpful in assigning right-of-way to intersections. Um, cons, speeds have been shown not to decrease after stop signs were added in residential neighborhoods. And there is an increase in noise. If you had a stop sign where there wasn't one before, people have to brake, accelerate. Uh, that creates more pollution and, and more noise. 
Uh, and cost, uh, it depends on how many you installed. Uh, there's a certain mobilization cost of, depends on the contractor, but three, four thousand dollars to do just about anything to come up to Aspen for um, signing contractors or striping contractors. And, and then you go from there with, with quantity discounts and how much you can get done in a day and overnight mobilizations. So we, we don't recommend additional stop signs in the West End with the possible exception of near um, the few that aren't there near um, parks and former school buildings. So here's a graphic from the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices. So it shows different options of standard um, crosswalks and there's some flexibility there but in terms of spacing and widths but so the primary purpose of crosswalks is to connect pedestrian and or bike facilities the west end is a sidewalk deferred zone you get more than about a block off of um, main street and you don't see many sidewalks so um, crosswalks can improve safety at appropriate locations but they can give pedestrians a false sense of security that vehicles will stop, and that's a particular issue at um, uncontrolled uh, or no stop sign or signal locations. So, um, in general, in Colorado, yeah, uh, those don't have a great amount of compliance. People should look at those with a grain of salt and see that cars are actually slowing down before using it, rather than just stepping out into them and and assuming that vehicles will stop. So crosswalks, um, pros, they do point out uh, pedestrian paths and, and give people an alert to that. But, but doing that just by itself um, doesn't necessarily Price. significantly improve safety. Price. The cost, again, it'll vary greatly, um, depending on how many you put in. So uh, we don't recommend additional crosswalks because there's little pedestrian inf infrastructure such as sidewalks to connect, I think we looked and there was one such location that had pedestrian infrastructure but no crosswalk in the West End. So um, those were the three um, ideas that were put forth that, were, that we studied um, at, at the request of, of residents. And then we were also tasked with coming up with any other idea we thought might improve safety in the West End. So you know, driving around, we saw you know, the, there's very few speed limit signs. I guess the, the, the de facto speed limit in Aspen is, is 20 miles an hour, but numerous people may not be aware of that. So increased speed limit signs um, would increase public awareness and I think decrease higher end speeds, say the upper 15% when they realize how far above the speed, the speed limit they are going. And um, there's a national, international campaign, 20 is plenty that uh, uh, talks about, you know, pushes for uh, reduced speeds in neighborhoods and talks about the speed, speed traffic safety relationships. So that might be something to look to implement on a private basis. It jives with the current speed limit. Um, so pros, higher end speeds are likely to be reduced after implementation, although we don't believe it would change overall speeds a lot. Again, those weren't shown to be a large issue, though, in the West End. So this one, we could put a specific cost to. We're looking at a speed limit sign every two to three blocks in each direction. So to cover the West End would be roughly $20,000 for new signs and posts. And we do recommend considering that. Um, so that's something we, we would suggest be given some consideration. And then we came up with a couple of other ideas which involve <coughs> um, striping, delineators. You know, I was, we were up here in um, late March for a field visit. We walked around with Scott. We saw how things were during the winter. There was an awful lot of snow banks. It was a very good snow year. And uh, so um, you do get much narrowing in the West End during the winter, and the um, the uh, striping is largely worn off. So I don't think the intent is to have striping that um, directs what people do in the winter. And uh, so that's why we say um, flexible delineators, we would assume those would be seasonal. 
So they would be put in, they would be taken out uh, outside of the snow plowing seasons. So here we've got some curb returns at the corners of the intersections. Uh, those could either be striped or, or have be reinforced with seasonal uh, flexible delineators. A double yellow center line would just um, narrow the perception of space uh, for vehicles in between uh, that and the uh, parallel parking. So, so it does force vehicles at the intersections to centralize themselves within the street, and it's likely that they would stay centralized uh, through that block rather than swerving out and coming back, I believe. And so um, it reduces the traveled way, you know, which can reduce the high end speeds due to the perceived um, loss of width. And as we were talking about with the, for the last hour and a half, you know, it's very narrow. It makes people feel uncomfortable. That forces, that helps to control their speed. So pros, higher end speeds likely to be reduced. Uh, cons would be annually putting in and taking out flexible delineators also. They are flexible, but they do sometimes break and would need maintenance. Um, so for the picture we just showed, uh, two intersections and a block in between, eleven to $13,000. So that seems like something that's worth consideration as a means of potentially improving safety in the West End. And we have one other, one other alternative, which was left off the earlier list by an oversight. But um, similar to the last one, uh, it would have um, here edge striping to delineate where the parallel parking is. In this example on the north side of the block, um, a double yellow center line. <coughs> and then it would uh, take out on street parking on, on one side, and that would become a protected, protect, protected pedestrian zone, say 10 feet wide or so. And that could be striped, or you could put in flexible delineators to help, help reinforce that. And I think that would give a lot of um, perception and reality of, of safety for pedestrians using that facility. And then that would just be on the pavement, so on the asphalt. And because then you're adding a pedestrian facility, then it would be appropriate to connect that block to block with, with crosswalks um, to help reinforce that facility as they um, cross streets. And it would reduce the width of the pavement, you know, between the stripes, 22 feet, 11 feet per lane. Um, I live in an older part of town in, in Denver, and uh, the, the, the north-south street next to me is, it's only 29 feet wide, and it's got parallel parking on both sides. So that, that only leaves you, uh, you take off 13 feet, 16 feet for the two lanes. So two cars, two fit, but people don't feel comfortable doing it. And so, you know, we look for spaces where nobody's parallel parked and you pull off whoever would get to this hole first would go through. Uh, first Avenue in front of my house, only five feet wider, but um, people hold their direction, uh, the speeds are higher. So it makes a big difference in how people um, drive, how they perceive. Right. There's one piece of this that Scott wouldn't know. The vast majority of the accidents along this route are actually parked against parked vehicles. So when you're considering this type of action, remember the 18 out of the 30 um, accidents in this area um, from smuggler all the way in from 2014 have been on, one was a lawnmower, but the rest were parked cars. So an alternative such as this would help delineate where parked cars should be and also indicate to people uh, where they should be driving. So say that that would prevent all those, but um, it certainly we would suspect that they would reduce. So. Oh, um, yeah, okay, sorry. So, uh, yeah, it would provide a safe space for residents to walk in, um, and, uh, but you would have a loss of on-street parking. Uh, so the last one was eleven to $13,000 for a two intersections in the block in between. This one we'd be looking at roughly uh, fifteen to $18,000. And so it would improve safety, especially for pedestrians, um, but there would be annual implementation costs. 
and you certainly want to get input from the residents in terms of uh, their value of, of a, a designated pedestrian facility versus uh, parallel parking. So. So before we get into recommendations from council, I first want to mention that these recommendations, even though um, they're not recommended by the, the traffic engineer, the council is certainly welcome to implement any of these um, any of these solutions. Also, before we get into discussion about the next steps, is there any clarifying questions that council has uh, for Scott or myself or, um, regarding what he just presented? Yeah, um, I'll start off. Um, Scott, have you ever uh, worked on a similar situation like this where it is, you know, a, a default alternate route through a neighborhood, that kind of thing? Um, yeah, and, I, and that was something that was stressed to us. Uh, you know, look for similar situations. Um, look for studies where, where it, you know, that's where that's, this is the only other way. Um, I have not personally worked on that. I know um, I have a tendency to, I don't like congested traffic and I know the roads around me rather well. So um, I have a tendency to seek alternate routes. When, <laughs> so when you do I, have experience with it. <laughs> I, I do, I do. And then like along I-70 between Denver and like Summit County, the traffic is horrible. And, they, and I understood the frontage roads pretty good. And then I studied them for five years. and then I knew them real well. But it's kind of in some kind of equilibrium there, and it's in some kind of equilibrium here in terms of people making choices based on what their understanding of the travel conditions are. Thank you. And uh, my other question was, uh, we've talked about putting a uh, temporary traffic counter on Power Plant Road to get some traffic counts. Um, I appreciate what you showed earlier. It's not really that dated, even if it was kind of pandemic time. It's, it's not really that dated. I'm just wondering the update for getting uh, some current traffic counts. Linda, give you a kind of an overview of what that's looking like right now with the OTC. Um, and Power Plant Road is included in that project. Right now, they're going to test out the equipment for the pre cord that you had all the questions about. And once that equipment tests out, we'll put them all in. And I would we don't have a timeline, we'll go through that with you at the OTC, but I think we have a month test just to see how it works, what information we get, and if it, make sure it aligns with what the goals you set for that work. We're, weren't we gonna put the Speedy Spy out there? Oh, we have the Speedy Spies out, one in the east side like you requested, and one on power plant. So the Speedy Spy gets numbers and speed. So we have both of those out on our own, like with our typical traffic calming uh, policy. So we did those both, based on your comment in our last work, work session. Uh, okay, so so we are currently counting cars going yes. <coughs> out Power Plant Road? Or it does both. Out and in? Yeah, both? Power Plant both out and in. Okay, cool. Um, that's all my... Uh, I guess, uh, wait, I do have another question. Uh, let's see. Uh, the stretch that you were just talking about, about potentially removing parking on one side of the road, I was interested in, uh, one, um, how many cars use that? Um, is that stretch, uh, uh, is there off-street parking? Do those homes have driveways or off-street parking? How many cars park in that stretch of uh, roadway that we would be interested in mm -hmm. removing that? And has that been shared with the neighborhood as a possibility? Um, I, I guess it's my understanding that, uh, I mean, I drew this up. It's just, it's not supposed to be anywhere in particular. It's not supposed to be this block between here and there. It's just a potential treatment. I, I think staff would look at. If you're interested in pursuing this option, we would do an outreach component. Um, I don't know the numbers of parked cars there, but I know that we get a lot of people that um, communicate with us when there's events down at the tent and stuff like that. That's when it's heaviest, yeah. and then it comes up. Okay. Um, that's all my questions for clarification at this time. John? 
I'm just looking forward to this eventual outreach to see um, what West End homeowners are most against, putting in sidewalks or losing street parking. That's going to be an interesting development. Sam and then Bill. Um, I appreciate that presentation, these potential next steps. Um, I have my own little experiment that I'd like to see done. And what I'd like to see done is two lanes outbound until 7th and Hallam Street. I would like the wait, pinch. Wait, slow down. Yeah, I'll slow do it down. all. All right. Step one, eliminate the left turn at 7th. Uh, at, no, sorry, at 7th and Main, and have two lanes heading out of town all the way until West Hallam and 7th Street. And that would prevent cars, and then putting, you know, we have a barricade at 7th and Hallam. I think if you had, like, a barricade heading westbound at four other points, um, then all the traffic would stay on Main Street for as long as it possibly can and only head through the West End for um, two blocks of which that are not very residential and lived on. And I think this would really help with the traffic problem um, and it would help uh, keep people on Main Street. And then the other side of the coin to this would be, and I don't know if this part's feasible, but I know that uh, the roads wide enough right now for the rest of it would be from cemetery lane to the roundabout if that could be two lanes instead of a merge then you would have much greater flowing traffic westbound from 3 to 6 p.m. and I think it could be beneficial to everyone as it takes four blocks of traffic away from downtown and also keeps cars out of the West End neighborhood but still allows them to use power plant road in a much more efficient manner. I guess, I don't know. I, go ahead. I, I would like to pull up Google Maps if I could, okay. but this is, um, so, yeah. Uh, so this, these, um, this presentation is about safety measures in the West End. Um, this is the, the recommendations that you're giving us is about um, traffic volumes, and some of that is already included as part of, you know, um, first of all, Council's, you know, top goal, and then also uh, our work plan in 2024. Not all of it is, but some of that is. So this is specifically focused on what can we do regarding safety in the world, <coughs> not necessarily traffic volume. Well, I think this does a lot for safety because with these barricades and this new traffic pattern, it would keep cars out of the residential neighborhoods in the West End and only have them travel on three blocks of not really residential road heading to Power Plant Road. So that, that's why I feel strongly about this experiment. Because um, when I talk to the West End Ped Pedestrian Safety Group, um, a lot of their concern is the cars on West Smuggler in particular, and that's why they want to turn into a bike or pedestrian road, um, which would, I think, just divert cars to North Street or to West Francis. So I'm not sure how much that helps, unless there was like maybe a rotating days of the week, but that sounds more complicated. But I do think the solution that I potentially bring up does keep cars out of the West End, and the infrastructure is already in place for it. It just needs a reconfiguration of painted lines to get cars to go that way. And we already put a barricade at 7th and Hallam Street, so four more barricades, I don't think should, barricades, should be that difficult um, to like help the flow of traffic, and I think this could solve many problems at once. I, I, I can't kind of run, I can't see it in my head. I need, I can I pull up Google Maps? I'd love to show it, honestly. See it. Corey, what he's asking for is right now there's two inbound on the S curves that come off the bridge. What he's requesting is we relook at the configuration of that. Is my thing on? He's asking us to relook at the configuration of the two inbounds and kind of flipping it so that the outbound has the two two lanes through the S curves. Not, not even that, um, the road's just as wide on the other side, it just doesn't have two lanes. I, I, think, I think there could be two lanes heading to 7th and Hallam regardless. We're happy to take a look at it. I think the only thing to keep in mind is the turning radius for vehicles that are 55 feet long. Uh, would be one of my my primary concern with what you're recommending, but again, we can we can do a geometric study, a uh, quick study on on just even if the turning radius fits for our, our public transit and our our um, private delivery folks. 
Yeah, I'm sure there's some kinks to be worked out, but I believe they could on at least the um, not inside lanes of those cars. Yeah, so just for clarity, in the past when that's been looked at, it's required um, acquisition of land uh, and, that, uh, and the removal of some trees. And those were non-negotiable items for the individuals sitting in your seats at those times that they were not going to uh, seek acquisition that would require like demolition of the structure. That's fair. And then so, you, and then you would so, it'd be two lanes down Main Street, turn the first right hand corner, yep. and then you would encourage people to go either over the bridge, or to. Yeah, the the, the new road. quote unquote pinch point would be right before the Eighth and Hallam bus stop. That's where the merge would be, or right. people could continue going straight, go one block to West Smuggler and then one block to Power Plant. And it would keep them out of the West End and it would keep people on Main Street. It would not back up cars as deep into downtown. And I think like with a potential um, cemetery lane to a two lane Highway 82 to the roundabout, it could really actually improve traffic out of town considerably. I, I don't know about that, but, but it's interesting. You know, I, I guess if I could, so, um, you know, we, we uh, as we were, I heard about this, and then I thought about it, and and I, I drew up exactly what you're talking about in MicroStation. Um, of course, that doesn't have anything to do with the study that we got, so I probably spent more time on my own dime than I should have for this study, <laughs> but, um, but I drew up that exactly. And it's interesting, as you come up, uh, come up power plant road to cemetery and you head back towards 82 coming from um cemetery you have a free right so you have to stop when the light goes red for 82 outbound but you've got a free right and an acceleration for the people that are coming off the of cemetery which is interesting but if you had two lanes over there yes you could um i think once you got across the bridge kind of taper it out to two lanes have two through lanes at the signal and control the people coming out of cemetery with a revised. Uh, I yeah. appreciate that. I've always been a big believer that our traffic volumes are high, but our traffic is terrible because of pinch points, not because of the S curves alone. Yeah. If we didn't have to keep merging, then yeah. traffic would flow. And then Pete said, think about something that's not so invasive and has a second lane. And then I drew up what you said second, <laughs> which was two lanes outbound and have like a lane drop at eighth and they would just clip the corner and then it would basically you would move your queue out of the West End onto Main Street without making the Main Street queue any longer. The, yeah, thank you again for that. The last point, just real quick, Pete, is all the stuff that has been drawn up, I think is the West End Pedestrian Safety Group being somewhat polite, but really what they want is cars out of the West End, which is not something that we necessarily can do easily. That's why I really, like believe in this potential solution for them. Um, but th that's, that's the point I'm trying to make. And I also hope that the solution could potentially alleviate traffic by keeping cars flowing forward um, without like having to go into like eight different roads in the West End and then all congregate at like West Smuggler and Power Plant Road as, of which they do now. Now it would potentially keep them on Main Street all the way till 7th and Hallam. That's the idea behind my little experiment. Maybe. Maybe uh, Sarah said that they're happy to kind of like maybe visit Scott's free time uh, drawings or whatever. But um, well, yeah. there, there was a study that's supposed to be coming up, which I would be, which I would love to do. But anyways, we'll see about that. Thanks. But thanks. Thank you. Sure. Bill. Thanks. Um, well, I, I just I'm um, gonna speak real quick. Um, I'm gonna this is myself. Scott. I'm Scott. Up. I'll come up to the mic. One bit of information I might be able to help you with. Trish, will you use the second mic in there? Or second could, one in? Second yeah, first not, one in? just don't use the one on the end. It seems to give us a pop and a... Apologies for the last... Second, second one in. All right, can you hear me? Yep, here we go. Let me, okay. This is Scott Winning, uh, project manager with the engineering department, and he was involved with the West End um, traffic volume study that we did. And... Um, the reason why he's not presenting tonight is he's the, the future assistant public works director of Carbondale and will be leaving the city here soon. But um, go ahead. Thank, thanks for introducing me, Trish. Yeah, so uh, 
yeah, the reason I wasn't presenting this myself was because I'm leaving, but uh, I did want to jump in and, and provide one tidbit of information that's really important here. Council did direct us in October, or I'm sorry, August 22nd, 2022, to do exactly what Sam's presenting here. So we have a holistic review of the S-curves, how to improve outbound, outbound flow coming. So just want to be patient. That's what Trish mentioned as 2024 work plan. That's what's on deck. So this is safety focus for now, flow soon. Okay, that's it, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Scott. Um, Bill. Uh, my first question is, have we ever had a situation during the on season where Power Plant Road was closed? During power plant iron gets closed every winter, winter conditions. So this is a common occurrence um, because it is not safe for many, particularly rental vehicles, to attempt to navigate that. Or big trucks. Does that cause conditions that are unacceptable to our community on Main Street frequently? I would suggest to you that that happens regularly, and it's a rather of what the council's tolerance for the length of backup during peak period is on Main Street. Yeah, what I'm trying to get at is how do we know how bad? There's been experiments that have done like the no left turn that started off for two days and then they took it down so fast because of the impact immediately. And that was just a left turn. So that means that people were able to left take like where? McLean. That's from power plant on back into so that you're not able to get back on to the highway. No left. Onto Cemetery. So you can only yes. go right onto Cemetery. Yes. Yeah. Um, and they couldn't even make it two days. And we know that when we've had impacts about like when we've had construction, we know how fast it happens. In fact, I, I've timed it how many times in construction about like I'd be out there timing flushes when something went down. We've had buses stuck on power plant road because they can't make the turning movements. So when somebody accidentally goes down that road that's too long like a trailer, it happens, I don't know, we it happens once in a while and we get a call and then we have to do kind of a time flush system where the police have to run out there. So we know how fast it can happen. And once it gets back to that fourth or fifth street, all of a sudden it gets really unsafe. So as soon as it gets back to Mill Street, you start seeing people panic at Mill Street and they start doing all kinds of like aggressive type behaviors to get through. You have pedestrians, you have lights. So we do know the impact of what happens when power plants affected. Does that answer your question? I, I think so, thanks. Um, I'm excited to delve into this traffic flow stuff because as I mentioned before, I think our issue is flow and it's not, um, it, it, the issue is not the S-curves alone. I think it's the flow all the way along the 82 corridor and ex looking at things like what Sam suggested and softening the S-curves and um, maybe some vehicular underpasses I think can go a long way, but obviously that's outside of the scope of what you're talking about. Sam also mentioned that, that the residents of the West End, which I can confirm through many conversations, are really asking to divert some of the traffic out of the West End. I don't think they're being impractical and asking for all of the traffic to be diverted or for Power Plant Road to be closed. Um, I don't think that they're also asking for specific pedestrian safety um, improvements. That's not what I'm hearing about they're concerned about the overall volume of traffic in the West End, and that's where I think this study, although interesting, um, is sort of missing the mark. It's not talking about how do we divert some of the traffic out of the West End. A and I, I think that's what's really being asked of us, and that's what's important for us to, to remember. Um, that's why they are asking us to look at a, another bike only, um, what are we calling those things, ped, ped bike, way. Um, so I'm not sure anything that's presented is really what's getting at the desired outcome here. Um, I, you know, do, d does making the vehicular experience more painful accomplish anything? I don't know. That's some of the other things that they're asking for, but which you guys didn't present. And when, what I mean by that is speed bumps and speed tables and you know, things that you have to go around for. I don't know any of the technical terms for these tracking chicanes. devices, but chicanes. Um, 
you know, I, I don't know, but I think I really don't think that we're getting at the desired outcome, which is less than 650 or whatever that number was, cars per hour in peak period. And it's really an afternoon thing, and it's really more summer than it is winter. Um, so I don't think we need more studies. I don't think we need more community outreach. I think we need to do something, and I think we need to do something with the goal of diverting some of the traffic out of the West End during the peak afternoon hour. That's it. So I'm gonna go back to the threshold question is, what is the acceptable level of service on Main Street to accomplish that? Because that is the conflict that we are trying to put more cars through a tiny spot than what there is. And until there is significant infrastructure investment, this problem is not ending. And anything you do with meaningful impact will take several um, improvements. Yeah, and I don't, I, don't mean it's, I don't mean stop signs. I don't mean tweaking here or there. These are major improvements for what you're trying to accomplish. So um, the direction we received last August was to not sacrifice further Main Street backup to reduce flow in the West End at this time based upon the sa safety data at that time. So that's a critical discussion for the council to have is about that trade-off. Everything else we're saying really doesn't mean anything in this conversation until the council works out that particular issue amongst the five of you and comes up with some direction for staff. Thank you. Uh, I, from my perspective, I, I think that some additional traffic on Main Street is acceptable. I think we've reached an inflection point where we've realized that it's not acceptable, the amount of traffic that's going through the West End. Um, and so I think we need to make a compromise somewhere. And I think the more appropriate place for heavy vehicular traffic is Main Street and not the West End. Yes, and if we can come up with a solution that accomplishes that, I think we would go for it. But what we recognize is that um, if we do measures that increase the traffic on Main Street, that is the same reason that people are looking to get around Main Street. For sure, flow, so, so flow is the reason why people are done. You know what I mean? So it's, like, it's not it, a. It, it's not a preferred alternative, to so use the terrible term, to go through the West yeah, End. Yeah, if, if we try to solve it in the West End, putting more traffic on Main Street will make more people look for the opportunity to go back through the West End and stuff. But I, I think we're all in the same boat with what you're saying, is that, yeah, we, we're looking to alleviate this. We're looking for the, the solutions that actually work. And then um, if there's a small tolerance by uh, the council for impacts to Main Street, or if there's a way for us to lessen those impacts to Main Street, we'd be supportive of that. And that's what we're gonna try to get to. Again, right now we're taking, we're tackling item number one from the West End. And item number one from the West End for years uh, has been brought to us as their neighborhood safety, number one. Uh, number two, absolutely, is just traffic volume and what that means to their character of their residential neighborhood. But um, we're going to get to what you were just talking about and a little bit of what you were just talking about. Um, other questions, clarification of Scott or Scott's part of this presentation at this time? Okay, so, so let's move forward because the rest of this conversation will get us to talking about some of this other stuff. Okay. So as related to safety, not necessarily volumes, but as related to safety, some of the recommendations um, that the West End had asked was for limiting the speed limit to 15, adding additional stop signs, and adding additional crosswalks. Um, in Scott's presentation, he, he talked about, well, additional stop signs are not necessarily warranted, but could be um, a good idea around some vulnerable areas like parks. Uh, specifically on Bleecker Street. <coughs> and then additional crosswalks, there might be one area where additional crosswalk looks like um, is needed, but otherwise without having infrastructure to attach to it, um, he had concerns about adding those additional crosswalks without the continuous pedestrian um, a connection to those crosswalks. So essentially he's saying, let's not add crosswalks to nowhere. Um, so do we want to 
do we want to talk about the, the left bucket or do we want to get into the both buckets, the left and the, the, the right bucket? With Thanks. Uh, so, Council, the question is before you, you. You've seen the return on information that was requested. What do you like? What do you not like here? Um, and I'll just start at the end. Sam. Um, from, from every, I mean, I'm, God, volume is safety to me. I, I feel like, to everyone's point, like, I feel like we have to reduce the volume of number of cars in the West End and that these are just like Band-Aid measures until that takes place. And I, I, I just feel so adamant that is, until we take cars out of driving through the West End neighborhood, because they're all, I, I go back to what I was talking about earlier, they're all going to end up on Power Plant Road anyway. I think it's about keeping them on Main Street for okay. as long as possible. All right. So then. I, okay. Um, you know, often, Sam, you use the analogy of a Band-Aid. Often, Sam, if you get a cut or a wound, before you can get to treatment, you put a bandage on it. So you're right. Mm -hmm. But what you're talking about even just the, the one idea that you were talking about is potentially going to take the removal of objects made out of wood, cement, and the like. So while we're waiting to get to that level of solving volume problems, are there anything in, in these suggestions for increased safety that you are supportive of or do you not want to talk about this and you just want to focus on volume when we get to that discussion? I'll just say one sentence of on the West End Pedestrian Safety website. They ask for four-way stop signs. They do ask for pedestrian crosswalks along West Smuggler and they ask for enforcement. So those things I do support, but I do hope we address volume at some point. Right, okay. Thank you. Okay, so, so because of the website you're looking at, you are supportive of uh, more stop signs and a crosswalk. Pro pedestrian crosswalks along that West Smuggler and potential increased enforcement of um, police presence in the West End at those hours of the day. Thank you. Ward. Yeah, obviously um, volume is, is, is the issue, but what we're asked to address is safety. This is what this is all about, is the safety in the West End. And Sam, of course, this volume is safety, but we're not gonna decrease the volume. The best way to do that is to get people out of their cars. Um, we're, you talk about pinch points and flow uh, is what the problem is, but you, you, you change a pinch point and it just, backs up from that pinch point instead of at the Hick House a couple of blocks later. So in direct answer, I, I, I don't believe that, um, I think there are stop signs on every corner on Smuggler. Um, I don't think in putting more stop signs is, I, I don't know how you can do it except on the cross streets. Um, I don't know how that's gonna increase safety. Um, I think the speed, you know, putting up speed limit signs isn't, isn't going to change the habits of people or their speeds, but is the expense of putting up some more signs um, worth some comfort level for the residents in the West End? Maybe, maybe we could spend a, you know, fifteen twenty thousand dollars to put up some more signs. Maybe it will have some effect. Maybe it'll just have a calming effect on the on the residents in in the. West End. And really what we're talking about here is smuggler. Uh, turning smuggler into a bike pedway is gonna push traffic somewhere else and we're gonna hear um, a pedestrian safety group from a different street. So there's, there's short of uh, decreasing the number of people or the number of vehicles, there's no easy solution to this. I, there's no easy, it's a wicked problem. Um, I, I, I think putting some, uh, remo John brought up the question, you know, if the people are really concerned about pedestrian safety, remove it from a pedestrian or from a sidewalk exclusionary zone. If you really want to focus on safety for <coughs> pedestrians, put sidewalks in. 
if, if you want to uh, increase pedestrian safety, you can remove parking on one side of the street and put a delineated uh, pedestrian way on the other side. Uh, then you're pushing traffic, you're pushing parking onto the neighbors to the next street over. Um, so it, it, a former mayor one time told me, he says, you know it's time to get off a of council when you've told no to all of your friends. And there's a point when you have to, you can't satisfy everybody. And I think that, um, you know, I, I think chicanes in a center uh, island going down uh, smuggler would decrease uh, the, the volume, perhaps push it somewhere else at great expense. Um, but the, the, the simple answer is that there is no simple answer. Um, and asking for my uh, recommend, uh, on your recommendations, I think it's no, no great loss to us to put in some, uh, some more speed limits, some more signs. Uh, decreasing the speed limit to 15 isn't gonna, according to studies and recommendations, isn't gonna make a uh, measurable distant, uh, difference, but uh, if for the cost of doing that, um, it gives some comfort, I, I would be for that. Um, but it, it really does boil. If you're gonna be focused on safety, look at safety measures. And that's, you know, put sidewalks in the West End or on Smuggler. That would increase um, uh, pedestrian safety. I, I know the people in, uh, on Smuggler don't want to hear that, but if you're going to focus on safety, that's the solution. Um, in nobody, uh, everybody wants to see a clean flow of traffic down Main Street, through town, out of town, uh, with no traffic on smuggler, but it's not going to happen because the amount of volume, the amount of traffic, the number of vehicles, the number of single occupancy vehicles, the number of construction vehicles, the buses, all of the, the volume that this town requires is creating this problem and putting a Band-Aid on it by putting up some signs. It may help, it may not, but it may um, satisfy some people for a pretty low cost. So um, putting up 15 mile an hour speed limits, um, looking at uh, taking away parking on one side of the street and putting a delineated uh, either by uh, some kind of a little bulb or barrier or painting. But I imagine in the winter time, you'd have to remove those for snow removal. Um, but um, yeah, I, in the short term, I would see putting up 15 mile an hour um, speed limit signs, increasing the number of uh, signs that are in the neighborhood because I don't think it's going to make much of a difference, but it may make, may make people feel better. Um, and if, if you want to reach out to the people and see what they think about removing parking on one side of the street, decreasing the width of the street to, to slow traffic down, um, do that, but if we keep doing more studies and more outreach, we're not going to get anything done. So I would I would support 15 mile an hour speed limits, although I don't think it's going to do any good. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you. Um, I'll go last. I'll, I'll, do, I'll wait. John, do you want to just weigh in on some of these, what you heard, what you think you might support, what you'd like to just give direction to our team to follow up on? Yes. Um, obviously, doing nothing, that's not, that's not an option. We, this has been ongoing for a long time, and I've uh, spent a lot of time in the West End myself, so I'm acutely aware of the issue. Um, I'm with Ward. Uh, I would support putting in some speed limit signs, maybe some more stop signs, just to just to try something. I look forward to the, the extra mobility study we'll be looking at. And I do want to thank Ward for bringing up what I pointed out months ago, that the West End um, Pedestrian Safety Group is talking about pedestrian safety, but they are not talking about sidewalks. Thanks, Ward. Thanks, John. Bill? Thanks. Uh, I would like to do all six of these things. Um, 
acknowledging what you said, Tori, that these are sort of Band-Aid solutions and really the ultimate solution is increased traffic flow on Highway 82 and getting some people out of cars and incentivizing that behavior, um, maybe onto buses. I'd also like to suggest a seventh, which is we got to give some tickets in the afternoon for driving too fast and not stopping at stop signs and letting commuters know that there are consequences not to following the rules. Uh, it doesn't happen now. The only enforcement happens on Main Street. There's almost no um, consequences for doing whatever you want as you drive through the West End. So I'd like to see some more of that. I'd like to send a message. I'd like people to see an increased police presence there. I think it's important. We don't want to wait until we have um, tragic accidents to do that. So I think we should do that right away. I think we should do all these things. I think they're um, relatively low cost. I think combined, the stew might um, have an impact. And uh, I don't think we should do any outreach or any studies. I think we should try it all. Even if we get the location of the um, pavement markings wrong, those are easy things to reverse. We'll hear about it. Um, it's not high consequence changes. I think we should implement things as soon as possible. Um, I do like the, the north-south changes on 4th Street that were put in a couple years ago. That is essentially what Scott's talking about, um, the, the pedestrian safe route. I, you know, I defer to staff on where an additional one or two of those is appropriate going through the West End. Um, but I think, I think all these things, even the ones that are not necessarily recommended by staff, should be implemented to some extent, and uh, let's see what happens. Thanks. Um, I, I, I hear a little bit of consensus here around doing some of these. Um, I, I, the speed limit to 15 miles an hour is a little strange for me because we were talking uh, not just in the West End. So there's two ways to go about this. We have one sign as you enter Aspen that says speed limit posted, speed limit is 20 miles an hour, 25 or 20, no, 20. 20 unless otherwise posted. So you could, uh, so when it comes to this, I heard in the presentation that making the West End only 15 miles an hour, posting it in West End 15 miles an hour, creates a little confusion in other areas, this, that, and the other. My original support was for 15 miles an hour in city limits unless otherwise posted. For example, Cemetery Lane might be a 20 or whatever. Um, so I don't, I don't know how much we need to go into this. What we heard up here is that, yeah, if there's some speed limit signs that can be put up that you think are warranted to keep the message going, that's great. Should those be posted at 20 or 15? I don't know that we're I don't know that we know. I don't know that we know that it's going to change behavior, but what, we like, what I mean is, is it going to cause more accidents? I'm not sure. I no, think. I'm just wondering about the difference between 15 or 20, right? Right, right now it's 20. Because it's different and it might help. I don't know how it's going to hurt. So there's support for that. Are you, where, do you, where do you think? Support for 15, you want to try it? Oh, yes. It's just a sign or three. I'll try it. Um, so I'm hearing support for 15 miles an hour in the West End. I'm hearing support for uh, the potential of additional stop signs. We have added stop signs in the West End, so I don't know how many more, and I don't want this council to be prescriptive about it, but there is support for you looking at whether you think that an additional stop sign, uh, uh, a, a regulated intersection with stop signs is, is something that would help, then there's support for that. The options for additional crosswalks. I thought I heard really there was kind of one that we might want to start with. That's what, that's we, I think we only found, we looked around, we only found one, inter, one, one intersection where there was pedestrian infrastructure that didn't have a crosswalk. So other than that, you're adding more than one crosswalks where you have no pedestrian facilities, which to us is yeah, the regular, not That's wise. Fourth, fourth and smuggler. So, that makes sense given the. So if that, it, so I would support that. Like I, I would do that one. I don't think I would do more than that one. Let's let's check it out. And the reason I say that is because um, striped crosswalks 
are also an indicator to drivers uh, that it is an environment where pedestrians are getting treatment because perhaps traffic moves quickly, right? When you normally see striped crosswalks, they are at major intersections, not in residential neighborhoods. So I'm, I'm fearful that additional crosswalks would actually change that feel and make it, it almost encourage uh, drivers to uh, not heed them, but kind of learn from them. Anyway, you, uh, there's support for that additional crosswalk. Uh, yes, the speed limit signs, yes. The pavement marking, seasonal flexible delineators, I, I think that's something that you, I, I, we haven't really talked about that a whole bunch. I'm supportive. If this is something that you're like, hey, there's, a, there's an appropriate intersection for this, let's try it. Uh, and then the last one, I think we do need to um, work on that, get some information. Uh, like I said, I don't know what the parallel, where and what, par what parking is uh, impacted and whether or not the neighborhood and residents, how they feel about that. So that one, I don't know. It does need to come back to us before I think that one moves forward. Last one was Bill's last suggestion was about enforcement. Um, I see APD in the room, and that's probably why they're here, is to uh, chime in on things like that. I think we need to get more information back. Often when we talk about enforcement, Bill, it's, um, it, it's a combination of uh, challenges, staffing being the number one. Um, uh, so I want to hear more information about that, but I, I, I don't mind your suggestion, I just need to know from uh, our team and our staff what, what, what that looks like for them. Good news is this one can pay for itself. God, I hope not. Um, that would, uh, that, no, but I think in this situation it, it, it's warranted. Well, it there's would, a lot I, of bad behavior in the West End by drivers. It wouldn't I would for it. want direction from the table if that is the intent. We have never used the no, philosophy no, of no, fines no, to fund no, no, positions. No. Okay, thank you. I mean, that, sorry, that was a real critical community value. No, no. Um, that would be a whole bunch of tickets. It's, we do, we, we do it's it more parking. expensive. It's more expensive. Um, uh, not really, but, but I get your point. Um, there, it is a revenue generator. Let's just leave it at that. Um, okay, so we, we want more information on those last two. Uh, I, now, that's just Bill and I chiming in on enforcement. Is there a third council member that would like to at least get information back about what that means and what the impact to our APD is? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think we've seen that before, too. That sounds great. Okay. Is that some clarity uh, can on Can I ask? Thing? Oh, yep. There is, um, I don't know, you're looking at me. <laughs> um, there is enforcement associated with going to 15 miles an hour. Would you like to hear from the police department about that or come back later about um, the enforcement involved with 15 miles an hour? I'd love to hear from them. Yeah, all right. Yes? Sure, yes, we'd like to hear about it. Now or later? Right now would be good. Let's get this out of our way because you need to know well, um, in case we do not support that action. While they're getting set up, for the sixth one, do you want us to go out for an outreach um, to start asking the neighbors if they would support that before we come back to you with more information? Oh. Is there an outreach component to that? I don't think it's um, I don't think it's a, a an outreach program as much as it is like you did with the uh, Park Avenue. You were very targeted, or it's along that corridor. So once you, I, I, what I'm saying is. I would be interested in people that are actually on the, the blocks that you are talking about doing this, but somebody that lives two blocks over, I don't need a whole West End check-in on, on that. It's staff intensive. To, I just want to make sure that we're clear. I can, we can target that, but that is a heavy staff undertaking to do that to the level of what expectations are, and I want to make sure that... Tori, what if they came back with... Okay, we think it makes the most sense to go north south on First Street. I'm picking one out of the hat. And they presented it to, to us. Could we make the judgment call for one season to see, you know, this is, they, they say this is a heavily parked street. It is going to have impacts. It's going to push parking here and there. Would that be enough? 
Um, it would be enough for me to consider it, but I would make my decision difficult if I don't know what the neighborhood thinks about it. I, I mean, that's, you know. I, I think we need to, you know, to listen what's been said previously that community doesn't listen yeah, the council doesn't listen to the community. They do what they want to do. If we put, if we force removing parking on one side of the street, then we're right back where we, where you said, Bill, we were that the council doesn't listen to the community. So you, you can't have it both ways where you want to cram a solution down the throat of the neighborhood without asking what their input is or listening to their input and um, following what they want. So that it's... If you're going to listen to the community, you have to listen on every subject, whether it's STRs or removing parking. I think you may have misunderstood my criticism there, but we can talk about that separately. So, so uh, what is your, what level do you need from us? I mean, I, I, honestly, I, 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 yeah, before I would support that, I'd need to hear from the, the people that I was impacting. We will um, figure out a plan and how much um, how much the cost of that outreach will be um, and whether or not we need additional budget authority to do that. That'd be great. Yeah, I, I'd like to see that. Um, I don't know that, I mean, uh, I, I'm sure that they're going to get a full download of what this meeting contained and I'm sure they're gonna be aware of this so it shouldn't be too hard to get them to chime in because it hasn't been too hard to hear from them to this point. Yeah. Um, okay, so real quickly about enforcement, 15 miles an hour versus 20 miles an hour signage, right? The options in front of us are increased additional speed limit signs at the current speed limit, which is 20 miles an hour, or um, what this council is supportive of right now is signaling to the West End that this is an even slower residential neighborhood by going to 15. How is the APD impacted by that, and how? what should we be prepared for? Good evening, Council. Kim Ferber, your Chief of Police. And Bill Lynn, Assistant Chief. I thought that one was off. Excuse me. Um, I don't think it has a significant impact on the police department, to be honest with you. Um, Bill can speak to what we um, did in the past. This year, we have made sure that we have increased our uh, foot patrols down in that area, as well as the bicycle patrols. And uh, we strategically have our troops there every afternoon if we have availability. Um, the biggest concern for me is hearing that the speed limits really are um, between 20 and 22 miles an hour is what we're seeing from vehicles. So I don't know that the change in the speed limit signs to 15 is going to make a big impact on the number of vehicles that we're stopping and taking enforcement measures on or educating. Bill, do you want to speak to? Sure. So historically, for example, last year we had police officers or community response officers out on the um, the bike pedway specifically nearly every day throughout the summer uh, during rush hour traffic. And interestingly, we, we did contact a lot of people on that road driving inappropriately. Uh, a great number of them are tourists following Google Maps, and and also a good number of them were non-English speakers who, who you know, were able to, to we were trying to explain to them the purpose of that road and why they shouldn't be driving on it. But, um, but we, it is not a, a target-rich environment for the sort of enforcement that I, I believe uh, Councilmember Guth is is telling us about where where there's a lot of tickets to be written. It's, it's remarkable how hard it is to find someone actually running a stop sign on Smuggler, but, but that's mostly because of the density of the traffic there. They, it, it's hard to run a stop sign if you're bumper to bumper to bumper through it. Um, we have placed a, a car for weeks at a time on Smuggler at Fifth Street, right adjacent to the stop sign, and and just watching that because we've gotten specific complaints about that. And and once traffic picks up, there's really nobody to stop because it, everybody's going slow. Thank you for that. So council members, our consideration here is a few more signs at 20 or uh, sign it at 15. Yeah, sign it at 15 and add sign. I'm sorry, Bill, sign it at 15. 15. And, and, and add signs yeah. add to the corner. Yeah. 
the right. kind of combination of the two. All right. Yeah. yeah so it's like All right. Yeah, I don't think it's going to make a, a big difference, but I think it might help perception in the West End. Okay. All right. Uh, we'll stick with that then. The 15 mile an hour speed limit needs to be done through an ordinance, so we'll come back to right. um, our first and second speed limit meeting. change. Right. <laughs> And the stop signs. Oh, yes. Okay. And the stop signs. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Thanks. And now, is there more? Are we going to discuss a little bit about the 2024 work plan or um, the volume, the volume measures? No, that scope was pretty well aligned to us in the February, uh, August 2022 work session of what the request was. After you adopt your goals, the goal work plan will come back, and it'll be at a high level in there. But that the we were given pretty clear direction last August regarding that study. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yep. All right. So uh, that brings us to a point on our agenda, guys, where this kind of comes back to council table. We have an opportunity for board reports and council updates, but before that is... Uh, West End traffic modification request. So, um, you know, that was part of our discussion. Um, we've received requests from West End safety, pedestrian safety group about um, the bike pedway on Smuggler, uh, specifically um, a couple others, but that's really the latest one that's kind of come as, as, as a request. So this is just an op opportunity for us to check in with each other about our willingness for, for that, that request or any other uh, traffic modifications at this time. I'll start the conversation. Um, looking at the map that we had presented in front of us today, we have four-way stops on the entirety of Smuggler. Uh, I'm, I'm not prepared to put in a one-block or two-block Smuggler uh, ped bikeway um, without knowing without knowing a little bit more about what impact that has on the rest of the system. I, I am in the same camp as those that want to look for ways to increase the flow of our Main Street traffic corridor through the S-curves, through the Cemetery Lane Light, through the roundabout, and further on down Valley. Um, but I leave that open at this time if anybody wants to voice support or any questions therein, this is our chance to talk about it. Um, I, I would love to look into what I discussed earlier, if that's okay to just look into if that is a possibility, because I do think that would be huge. Yeah. And I'd also like to look into, when I spoke to the West End Pedestrian Safety Group, they wanted the PED bikeway to be from West Smuggler starting at 7th Street, the first street. Um, and, you know, it gets complicated for me because I, I would say to them, I'd say to anyone, which is I think that just puts traffic on the North Street in West Francis. So I don't really know what that solves, but I know Smuggler, West Smuggler feels like they're taking the brunt of everything. So I'm sympathetic there. The, the only other thing that I can think about, and I don't know how to implement it, <laughs> not that I would, but is um, different days of the week, different streets being utilized to... So somehow utilizing different streets to get people to power plant road in the West End rather than West Smuggler feeling like they're the only one that's being used. Um, if there is some solution there, that's something I would be happy to explore. Uh, Ward, uh, what's, what is your, where are you, I mean, we, we're, we're taking a few steps forward with pedestrian safety in the West End. We are gonna be talking about, uh, you know, flow patterns and volume changes. Um, it's a priority for us. It's, it just takes a little time because we are talking about not just putting a Band-Aid. We are talking about suturing up and <laughs> stitching it together. So, Duct tape, gorilla tape here. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't support another pedestrian uh, bike pedway from 1st to 7th on Smuggler. We have one at Halma block over. Again, if safety is a concern, put it in sidewalks. If they want, if people in the West End want safety to be their major concern, 
remove themselves from a um, sidewalk exclusionary zone and let's, let's talk about um, pedestrian safety. But I don't, I mean, we, we've worked on uh, considerable outreach for the, the um, pedway from the music tent over towards uh, Red Brick. Uh, we did the same thing for Hallam. Um, and I, I, I don't see a warrant for parallel ped bikeways on Hallam and, and Smuggler. I appreciate it. I think that this would come back to us in some of the further work that's going to be done because this will be talking about, uh, this will impact flow and volume. So, uh, you know, in some way, this is going to be part of, of the conversation, as Sarah says, as we uh, adopt our council goals, transit and mobility being one of the um, most important to us, that, that this will be part of that conversation. Um, John, your feelings at this time? Yes, uh, I do not support a bicycle ped way on Smuggler. Um, because as it's been stated already, it will, it's just gonna push traffic onto adjoining streets. I would be interested in seeing whether the people that live on Smuggler would be interested in giving up uh, parking on one side of the street to facilitate more pedestrian safety that way. But I will wait to hear back from them. Thanks. And, and Bill? Yeah, I agree with, with pretty much everything said. I have another traffic modification topic that's outside of the West End. Would you like that now or um, um, you want to close the loop to, on this two one? Two seconds. Sure. Let's get to council updates Thanks. and you can throw it in, <laughs> in there. Um, well, it is, it is like a traffic and a safety thing, but it is outside of the West End. Yeah, I understand. So, yeah, just, I'll, I'll give it to you right right next. Okay, cool. so, so right now we don't, <coughs> um, we don't have uh, support for that action at this time. Um, but I do, like I said, I do know that that will come up again as we talk about uh, alternatives for impacting flow and volume. Uh, with that, go right into your other Thanks. one. I think we're doing something wrong with the way we're um, signing or educating people on the one-way streets in the core. There's not a day that goes by that I'm not seeing somebody driving the wrong way on a one-way street. I, I just, I'm sorry. Mr. Mayor, could you please summarize any direction about the council-led conversation before jumping into council updates? I don't have clarity um, right now if there is any action council wishes to take about those requests. There is not. Thank you. Or the one that I suggested, or? No, that's different. That's different, sorry. That the one thing that I heard that might be worth reiterating is John suggested that maybe the ped safety corridor would be on Smuggler, which didn't really come out in the previous conversation, which I think is a good um, concept for staff to explore. To move it from where it is over? No, so similar to what we have on 4th Street, one of the things that Scott presented with mm -hmm. the delineated pedestrian zone and you remove the parking on one side of the street, mm -hmm. John just suggested that happens on Smuggler, um, which is, a, I think, a very interesting idea. I wasn't necessarily thinking about an east-west version of that, but um, I think it's a very good idea oh. to explore. And that would necessitate removing one side parking on one side. Uh, yes, that's right. On Smuggler. On Smuggler. Which was actually that was, yeah, that was kind of what I thought they were talking about when Scott said that he would he just had uh, drafted kind of a generic block. I was actually picturing it on Smuggler. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm glad we talked about it. So it's yeah. I, I think that's a good target place to explore. So. Okay. Um, Does that help? Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And and I'm supportive of that. That's what I thought. I, I was thinking of it on Smuggler, and and that might have. That might have some impact on uh, deterring some some usage there. Um, okay, one ways downtown. Well, one ways downtown. The do I, not I mean, enter signs. There is not signs. a single day that goes by that I am not in the corner. I'm seeing somebody driving at full speed going the wrong way on a one way street, and it's I'm just so scared of this. I, I don't know why people aren't seeing the do not enter signs, but we're, do, we're clearly doing something wrong because it's happening so frequently. So okay. I would really request staff um, try something else and more. And I don't know if it's temporary bollards. I, yeah, yeah. Something, it is just, to me, um, scary, very scary. Understood. Uh, it'd be interesting if we could understand this, the scope of the problem. You know, y you observe it, I assume, because you're at 
that building on Cooper. Yes, I yeah. see it on Cooper, but yesterday I saw it on um, Mill? Hyman, someone turning off of Galena onto Hyman the wrong way. Um, okay, that side, yeah, because I was going to say. everywhere, and, and, uh, and we don't have a lot of one-way streets, but all of them are where I'm seeing it. It's not isolated to one block. Um, I see it more frequently than anywhere else on Cooper because that's where my office is, and I often stand out on the, on the uh, walkway and make phone calls, but yeah. it's, it's happening throughout town, and I'm just like, it's, it's not going to be good. Um, At some point it's gonna well, be. well, what's interesting about that is that over on uh, by the Wheeler, <coughs> where the one way goes around the Wheeler, um, it's very rare that you see a car going the opposite way on that one way. It's and it's it's strange because I always look at that coming from Wells Fargo direction. If you look, it's um, there's one sign over on the side, and I mean it's not any more signage, but it, it's effective. So it's, ve it's, very, right. it's very interesting. Mm. Over there where you're, where you're talking about, um, I think it's worth just a look. Uh, maybe you and I should just go, go look and, and, and talk about it a little bit more. Yeah. And then we can obviously, I mean, our, our team is ready to say like, hey, well, here's some options if you think this is necessary. But I, well, I think it's unquestionably necessary. I mean, you got cars going the wrong way into yeah. probably what is our busiest pedestrian crossing in town. It right? does happen. Paradise, right? And it's happening multiple times a day, every day. So yeah. I would really like to do whatever we can to make that safer. Why don't we start with, let's just meet up and talk about it. And let's go, we'll walk it together and kind of look at what's up. Uh, okay, thank you for that. Hey, council, that leads us into our council updates and board reports. Um, if there's any items that you'd like to speak about now, you're welcome to bring those up or do board reports. Um, I'll start off with a board report. Last Thursday, uh, I had the RAFTA retreat. It was a almost full day of discussions around uh, four topic items, uh, such as uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, environmental uh, sustainability for RAFTA as an organization, first and last mile and increased transit usership. Um, and uh, these were items and topics that came out of our kind of retreat steering committee. And then we went over them uh, as well as uh, future of the organization, succession planning and housing. So we, we went over those and to be quite honest with you, I was really proud of the work that we did last year that kind of teed those up for us. So not a whole bunch came out of the retreat except to uh, continue to support the values that councils uh, from here to Rifle have been talking about with RAFTA and transit. Um, it was a great meeting. It's always great. I'm really glad to hear that all of us are planning on being in person at EOTC because not just working on the issues is, uh, is wonderful getting together in that person to person environment, but also seeing each other working with each other face to face is just a, a, an excellent opportunity for us to really build those uh, collaborative bonds. And we, we, we are thinking more regionally now about almost every issue than we probably have uh, ever. So um, more than anything after, out of the rafter retreat was, uh, I went down to Carbondale in person uh, for, for our board meetings, I've been remote and just being there in person was really great connecting with our fellow community members, um, sharing ideas. But again, you know, nothing, uh, nothing uh, ground shaking or new uh, came out of it, but really affirmation of kind of the direction that we've been going. Um, you know, we uh, very much try to focus on RAFTA as an organization and their role in transit and mobility. And we don't get into things like highway design and improvements that we all talk about at times. So um, that's really what I have to report back for me from, from that RAFTA retreat was, was uh, an enjoyable get together. Yeah, it was enjoyable. I was remote for that. Um, but I was the core board, um, did the, that meeting last Thursday and things to note were they, they visited Cold Basin and found 28% methane content gas emissions, which is evidence confirmation bias of what they suspected. 
Is that a lot or a little? Uh, it's something, I think normal is like 10. So it's, 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 so it's elevated. It's elevated. Yeah. Um, then today Dallas was meeting with the BOCC, hoping to unlock some funding from Pickens County for core and trying to clean up processes to allow rent money to go to core without a joint meeting with the city of Aspen. Um, they're working on other like workforce grants. Um, Building IQ has gone well for them with benchmarking. They have another event coming up on July 27th, State of Art of Architecture at the Aspen Art Museum, and Climate Conscious Kitchen had like 150 plus people there and was very successful. So. What's the date of that architecture thing? July 27th. Okay. It's in partnership with uh, Roland and Broughton. Oh. So it's not just an exclusive core event. Cool. Roland and Broughton. Good. Sam, I. I didn't understand, uh, you were talking about a, a confirmation bias at uh, Cole Basin on Twitter. Uh, it was just that they went exploring, suspecting that they would find elevated methane content, and they were confirmed in their bias that they would find that elevated methane content. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Other board reports? I have none. I had to miss the core board, uh, my other job, intervened and, and, <coughs> and Sam filled in for me. Thanks, Sam. Yep. Thanks. Now we had an extensive, John and I were in an extensive APSHA meeting, another one coming up on Wednesday with the hearing. Um, so it's um, proceeding with the, um, what was the last thing that we did to, to, to confirm the uh, um, smuggler run, um, the upsizing category five, yeah. So they can put in foundations. Right, uh, on the condition that they're being replaced, not just upgraded, that they can upgrade to uh, category five on that. And um, I think four of us are going to be at CML um, between Sunday and Wednesday. Who else going? Are you going, Tori? I am not. Sam, are you going? Yes. Bill? Okay, so three of us will be in uh, Aurora for that. Uh, I found that useful in the past, and um, like Tori said, I think that in-person meetings are really important, and to meet people from around the state, um, different municipalities, I think it, it's, it's really enlightening what we're doing and how we can improve and how we can help other communities improve. So I'm looking forward to another CML. And last one I went to, the AS one, but it ain't happening this year. <laughs> Any other items? Well, if there's no other items for council discussion, then we can call it an evening. I want to remind you guys that we start tomorrow at 4 p.m., not 5, mm -hmm. 4 p.m. tomorrow. I would suggest that we convene up here and go through the normal process we do with, with an executive session, uh, Make the, uh, consider going into the executive session here, and then can, we'll go downstairs and have the meeting. There will be two people. Um, online. Yeah. So. <laughs> that is correct. Hey, I'm just wondering if the engineering last so soon because I wanted to ask a question offline. How many of those parked cars that were damaged in the West End were damaged by Lance Armstrong? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, grassroots. <laughs>